Roland summoned one of his trusted guards waiting outside the door and instructed him to retrieve a prisoner from the cell and also bring Carter along. The testing grounds had been set up outside the city walls. As a precautionary measure, Roland called upon four squads of elite soldiers from the First Army, positioning them in a circle surrounding the testing grounds, armed and on high alert. The test subject was a death row inmate charged with robbery and murder. He straightforwardly informed the prisoner that if he sacrificed himself for the test, his family would receive a reward of five gold royals. After a moment of hesitation, the inmate agreed to the condition. After swallowing two pills, the expression on the prisoner's face quickly transformed. Veins bulged on his forehead and arms, his skin turned a deep red, and his breath became rapid. He seized a wooden sword and charged fiercely towards Carter, who stood there calmly, waiting. His speed was akin to that of a sprinting wolf, leaving small craters in the ground with each step. The opponent was nothing more than a murderer, lacking any formal combat training apart from his inherent ferocity. Yet, he was able to hold his ground against Roland's chief knight. Roland gazed at the two figures in the distance, realizing that the church had not lied. If this drug were to be used by well-trained knights, their fighting prowess would be unimaginable. A deep gash was slashed across his side, blood flowing freely from the wound. Such an injury would significantly hinder the movement of half his body, but he appeared unfazed. He turned around and lunged at the knight once again. Carter employed the same tactic, delivering a powerful impact that made the criminal stumble back two steps. The wooden sword also snapped in response to the forceful blow. Carter threw another wooden sword at him, but the criminal did not catch it. Instead, he looked up at the high wall. As Roland locked eyes with him, in the blink of an eye, his speed reached an unimaginable level, akin to a galloping wild horse, charging toward Roland. Carter shouted for the soldiers to shoot the criminal, and at that moment, the other soldiers had already pulled the trigger. Blood spattered from the criminal's back, yet his speed remained unabated as he swiftly broke through the encirclement. The criminal leaped into the air, effortlessly scaling the several-meter-high wall. Just as he was about to strike Roland, a woman appeared before him, holding a green flame in her hand. Immediately after, another woman in white emerged, wielding a gleaming silver dagger, slashing at him. The injured soldiers were swiftly healed by Nanawa's abilities. They were already familiar with the power of the pills. The black pills had equally astonishing effects. Even a severe slash that nearly severed their ribs or a close-range strike couldn't halt their movements. If it were an ordinary person, they would have long lost their combat effectiveness due to the pain. What troubled them, even more, was the fact that the church was willing to offer such substances. Had they not considered the possibility of the new king using the pills against them once Grey Castle was unified? Unless, they held even stronger cards in their hands and simply didn't care about such an eventuality. Roland sighed as he contemplated the situation. He had initially planned to resolve the town's issues of population and insufficient funds by attacking the Changa stronghold, his focus would then shift to education, production, and agriculture, aiming to transform the border town into a city within a short period of time. As for weapon research, he had intended to set it aside temporarily. However, it now seemed apparent that military development couldn't be neglected either. Flintlocks still needed to be produced, and the research of new weapons, such as the breech loader and cartridges, should be prioritized on the agenda as soon as possible. After careful consideration, Roland concluded that the danger posed by mercury fulminate was too significant. Instead, he decided to invest in recruiting a group of alchemists. He would establish a laboratory in a corner of the town and allow them to explore and experiment on their own. After dinner, Roland called Anna and Scroll into his office. Every night, he set aside some time for teaching sessions. Suddenly, Roland heard a faint sound of breathing. Nightingale had unknowingly fallen asleep on the sofa, perhaps finding the lessons akin to a lullaby. The mist that veiled her mind dissipated, exposing her less than graceful sleeping position in front of the three of them. The prince couldn't help but shake his head with a mix of amusement and exasperation, deciding to conclude today's lesson. He gently removed his coat and draped it over her, extinguished the candle, 
and closed the door along with Anna and Scroll. Upon returning to her room, Anna tossed a cluster of green flames into a large wooden tub filled with water. Soon, steam rose from the surface, indicating its heat. She undressed and stepped into the tub. When the witches wanted to cleanse their bodies, they would seek Anna's help to heat the water. After all, fetching hot water from the kitchen was quite troublesome. The revelation seemed to astonish His Highness as if he found it difficult to accept the practice of reusing bathwater. At this thought, Anna couldn't help but find it amusing. For a normal resident, it was a luxury to bathe once a month, so the practice of reusing water multiple times was nothing out of the ordinary. Anna reminisced about today's lesson. Roland had mentioned that the world is composed of countless tiny spheres, so minuscule that they need to be magnified millions of times to be visible to the naked eye. Raising her right hand, the ethereal flames of magical energy glowed like a cluster of fireflies, motionless at her fingertips. Suddenly, a thought struck her. If everything was composed of these tiny spheres, could she make herself as small and spherical as they were? Anna closed her eyes, envisioning herself as a conglomeration of countless particles. The flames began to undergo a transformation. The next morning, Roland was still in a blissful dream, driving tanks, and aircraft carriers, and Gundam. Nightingale excitedly called out to Roland, her face beaming with joy. She exclaimed that Anna's abilities had undergone another transformation, unlike anything she had ever witnessed before. Anna's magical form was astonishingly solid, almost like a physical entity. Roland quickly washed his face and dressed before following Nightingale upstairs to the second floor and entering the office, where the attention of the eleven witches immediately shifted towards him. In the morning, as Nightingale passed through Anna's room, she noticed Anna sleeping with her head resting on the desk. Upon closer inspection, Nightingale realized that the magic within Anna had taken on a fixed shape, resembling a continuously rotating cube. Anna recounted her experience to the other witches, explaining the concept of the small spheres, vibrations, connections, and the changes in her abilities. However, they still appeared perplexed, unable to grasp the connection between these elements. Anna had successfully reshaped the form of her flames, allowing them to coil and converge according to her will. With this newfound ability, Anna attempted to slice through an iron ingot, utilizing the formula S equals pi R square to cut out a perfect iron circle. Roland asked to see Anna's new ability, Anna extended her finger, and a mass of black flames materialized out of thin air at her fingertip. It appeared similar in shape to ordinary flames, except for the fact that it lacked any luminosity. Anna was able to alter its shapes, from a cube to a blanket, to strings even thinner than a human hair. Roland couldn't help but marvel at Anna's brilliance. Apart from calling her a genius, he couldn't think of a more fitting description. The fact that she could immediately comprehend and apply new knowledge to her abilities after learning it that same night showcased her exceptional thinking and absorption abilities, which only highly gifted individuals possessed. Anna's transformation also sparked his interest in delving deeper into the essence of this world, eager to explore its true nature. Roland made the decision to appoint Scroll as the teacher and initiate the teaching sessions for the Witch Alliance. Later that afternoon, Roland gave the surrendered knights from the Chang stronghold a chance to redeem themselves, some of them were assigned as farmers, while some were assigned to breed animals. The knight brought into the reception hall was tall and impressive, exuding remarkable handsomeness at first glance. This is Ferlin Eltek, the captain of the Lionheart Knight Order also known as the Dawnbreaker, the foremost knight of the Western realm. Ferlin knelt on one knee and showed the utmost respect and congratulated Roland on taking over the chang -E stronghold. Ferlin is the chief knight for Duke Ryan, his wife, Eileen, was originally a commoner working in the theater they met and fell in love, however. Ferlin family did not support the marriage, as a result, Ferlin moved out to a small farm and married Eileen shortly after. Eileen finally got her first opportunity for a formal performance in the theater. Unexpectedly, the Duke watched the play and took an interest in her. Soon after, while Ferlins was away on a mission, he broke into the house and assaulted Eileen. Ever since, Ferlin had always waited for the chance to kill Duke Ryan. Soon, his left scapula felt the pinch of Nightingale's fingers. Indicating that Ferlin was telling the truth, 
Ferland is a well-educated knight, rather than sending him to the mines, Roland appointed him as a teacher in the border town. Ferlin bowed and presented a treasure map, hoping to ask Roland to spare his old subordinate Halon, who's 50 years old and illiterate. In the center of the map, there is an equilateral triangle, and the three acute angles connect three locations. One point falls at the end of the northern slope of the mountain, while another point is located within the enchanted forest, marked by a hexagonal star, presumably indicating the hidden treasure location. However, Roland's attention was completely drawn to the vertex of the triangle. It is located within the savage wasteland and represented by a jagged mountain peak, with the word Takira written on it. Roland called scroll over, the contents of the treasure map align with the miscellaneous notes recorded in ancient texts, which can be seen as indirect evidence of the church's construction of a city deep within the savage wasteland to run from demons. Maybe they could find some evidence there, Scroll's voice began to shake, she doesn't know why is the church trying to hide this history, and why does the church hunt witches as if they were demons. The hexagon star indicated on the map is only 50 kilometers from border town, Lightning can arrive there within one day, hopefully to scout some important info. Ever since Roland's plan to start providing the Witch Alliance education, Soroya has been tirelessly printing out worksheets and textbooks. Before Roland let Scroll go, he had something to give her. Roland opened a drawer, and immediately Nightingale started to stutter. It was full of snacks, Roland quickly closed it and opened another drawer. This time he handed over a small box, when Scroll opened it, it was a pair of glasses, even knowing Scroll doesn't have vision problems, this is purely for aesthetics. Arriving at the mine on the northern slope, he picked up a steel pipe and examined it. The pipe was perfectly round with a smooth surface, and there were no visible pores or imperfections. In the center, there was a circular hole that was as smooth as the outer surface. When he aligned it with the sunlight, he could see a linear highlight along the surface. By using the high-temperature magical lines to cut objects, while maintaining precise control, Anna was capable of single-handedly elevating the town's industrial products to a new level. They did a series of tests to find out the maximum range for Anna's ability. Nightingale said it was 10 steps, while Anna said it was 15 steps. Roland quickly figured out, they are both correct, but because of their height differences, they gave different measurements. Roland knew, the next step is to have a standard measurement unit. In the green water port, the influx of resources and population from Eagle City greatly strengthened the power of this harbor city. The raiders reaped abundant rewards, and the slave market became lively as well. The Black Sail fleet, after a series of battles, not only suffered minimal losses but also acquired a large number of slaves to serve as sailors. They were currently undergoing intense training at the harbor. In a few days, they would set sail for the straight route, starting their first raid of the year. Now that Timothy had suffered a major defeat, there was no one left in the Grey Keep Kingdom who could stop Garcia, given time, Garcia Wimberton would undoubtedly become the ruler of the Grey Castle. Soon, the chiefs of the Sandstone Clan and the Blackbone Clan arrived. The chief of the Sandstone Clan is a petite woman, while the chief of the Blackbone Clan is tall and rugged, with scars covering his face and muscular arms. They both kneeled before Garcia and respectfully spoke. After the last battle, Many of our warriors have been experiencing weakness and fatigue. Only by regularly taking the new pills can we find relief. However, our supply of pills is running low. We have come here to request that you provide us with more of these pills. Garcia declined the request and simply told them to wait. The two chiefs wanted to know when will they be receiving new supplies, and Garcia's chief knight yelled at the guard to take the two chiefs away while telling them to prepare either gold royal or dark water as department. After closing the doors to the terrace room, Garcia let out a soft sigh. She wasn't concerned about the sand people or the church's pill because she had already threatened the nearby priests. If they didn't provide her with the supplies, she would hang their heads on the bow of her ship. Garcia's headache came from a letter she received, intelligence sent by her spies in another country. The report stated that the church, using the pretext of Queen Lina's hidden identity as a witch, had taken over the capital and seized control of the entire country. As he pushed open the heavy wooden door of the private chamber, a subtle scent of lavender greeted him. 
Bishop Malin had a fondness for candles infused with herbs and spices, particularly in enclosed spaces without windows. The fragrance it emitted brought him a sense of calm and tranquility. Aside from the nobility in the capital, there is little resistance from the rest of the kingdom. In fact, the common folk even welcomed the church's takeover, only a few stubborn and deluded nobles cling to the past glory, but they will be dealt with accordingly. Heather suggests that all the nobility be eradicated. Heather, born in poverty, endured hunger and homelessness before being taken in by the church. With her innate sharp mind and exceptional judgment, she has risen to her current position. Maine understands her disdain for the nobility very well. He ignored Heather and continued his speech, questioning the status in the Grey Castle, Taylor said, according to the intelligence, the new king, Timothy, did not return to the capital after his defeat. Instead, he went directly to the Eastern Territory. Maine proposed to cut the supplies of pills by 30% to Garcia, this way it balances the two-party. This way, within two years, there won't be any soldiers left in the Grey Castle. Taylor nodded agreeing on the plan, then said there were some issues in the Chang-Gi stronghold. After defeating Duke Ryan, Roland returned to the border town but did not respond to the church's invite. The three wondered what kind of person Roland truly was, whether it was wrong to choose Roland. Well, what do you think? Mean looked at Heather. Heather shrugged and replied. How else can we see it? What were the initial rumors about him? Incompetent, bad-tempered greedy, and lacking in skills. I don't think someone like that could possibly capture the Chang'e fortress, right? So the answer is simple, he deceived everyone, whether they were nobles or us. Are you suggesting? Maine furrowed her brow. Defeating a duke indeed proves his exceptional abilities, but even if someone is exceptionally talented, it is meaningless without sufficient resources to utilize. Taylor shook his head. Since he chose to return to that desolate place, it means he has given up any possibility of meddling in Grey Castle's affairs and naturally poses no threat to our plans. That's true in theory. However, when combined with this piece of information, it becomes quite interesting. Heather lifted her shirt and tossed out a small piece of paper. My personal intelligence. Maine spread out the paper and quickly scanned its contents. Which alliance? Returning to Bordertown, Roland had implemented a policy that offered serfs the opportunity to attain freedom by engaging in farming. However, Barov couldn't help but question why Roland was only demanding a mere 20% in taxes. In Barov's opinion, even a 50% tax seemed insufficient. Roland, on the other hand, clarified that accumulating stockpiles of gold in the basement served no purpose. Instead, he proposed levying a 20% tax and he will then purchase the remaining crops at market price. This approach would ensure that the castle received an adequate food supply while compensating the serfs. Once they had saved enough, they could begin purchasing items exclusively available in the border town. Ultimately, the money would flow back to Roland, leading to an improvement in living standards. Shortly thereafter, Carter and Shane returned as Roland had requested. Shane headed to the green water port to procure the seeds and plants. When Shane returned, he proudly presented a variety of items. First, he showcased what he referred to as pearl rice. A unique and high-quality grain, Roland knew this was a corn, additionally, he brought back two ground eggs, known for their distinct flavors, this was potatoes. Lastly, he presented sugar sticks, a delightful treat that added sweetness to their meals. Also known as sugar canes, Barov stepped back a few steps, watching the three of them happily discussing. My goodness. He muttered, touching the divine punishment stone on his chest. His highness is truly possessed by a devil. He had suspected this before, but now he was almost certain. The person he had just talked to could not have been the fourth prince. Barov's mind raced as he considered the drastic changes and unconventional actions of his highness, the sudden acquisition of new knowledge and the ability to lead people out of their predicaments seemed contrary to his understanding of demons. In myths and legends, demons were typically associated with malevolence and corruptive intentions. However, the prince's actions challenged Barov's preconceived notions. 
As Berev read through the prince's other proposed reforms, such as recruiting commoners into the city hall and providing education for all citizens, a shiver ran down his spine. He couldn't help but wonder what the border town would become if these reforms were successfully implemented. Berev took a deep breath, clutching the god's punishment stone in his hand. There was one lingering question, could demons possess benevolence as well? If anyone dares to say Roland is evil, Berev will be the first one to disagree, the actions of the fourth prince could be considered as those of a wise and compassionate ruler. In his eyes, he had surpassed even the legendary kings recorded in history by showing genuine concern for the well-being of every citizen. He chose to stay alongside his subjects in border town, investing a significant amount of resources to purchase food and ensure the safety of everyone during the treacherous month of the demons. Furthermore, he introduced advanced technologies and machinery, even the witch, what people refer to minion of the devil, utilized their abilities to improve the lives of the people. At that moment, Berev realized that even if Roland were to become the ruler of Grey Castle, it might not be such a terrible outcome after all. According to Shane's report, it seems that the church's pills are also circulating in green water port. Although Roland is unsure why as the church is simultaneously supporting Garcia and himself, he realizes that he must quickly produce the latest weapons. Suddenly, Anna appeared by Roland's side, startling him. She gently closed the door and walked to Roland's desk, holding a book with golden edges in her arms. She wanted to inquire about the quantum science that Roland mentioned. Roland couldn't help but feel both amused and frustrated, as the realm of microscopic quantum was already a mysterious and complex subject. If he had known, he wouldn't have included that part in his discussion. While thinking about this in his mind, he provided a rough explanation to Anna. She pursed her lips, seemingly dissatisfied with Roland's explanation, but quickly moved on to ask another question. By the time she stopped pressing for answers, Roland had talked himself dry. He underestimated Anna's thirst for knowledge, and at this rate, he wouldn't have much left to teach her. Especially when Roland inquired about her progress in mathematics, she answered with ease, saying it was too simple. Roland suddenly felt the vast difference between individuals. How long had it been? In just one week, she had progressed from elementary functions to matrix equations, and next would be calculus. Roland gazed at the woman, who was engrossed in flipping through the book and found himself lost in thought. Her delicate bangs rested on her forehead, with a few strands of hair naturally falling on her cheeks. He couldn't help but extend his index finger, tucking the strands behind her ear. She turned her head to look at Roland, almost as if her eyes filled with a smile. The serene blue pupils were no longer still like water but had rippled with waves. They gazed at each other in such close proximity until Anna mouthed a sentence without making any sound, and Roland still managed to decipher her lip reading. Nightingale isn't here. It was obvious as it could be, Roland felt foolish if he pretended not to understand. The room was silent, and he could almost hear the other person's breath and heartbeat. As he drew closer, Anna closed her eyes, and a blush appeared on her cheeks. Roland smelled the faint fragrance emanating from her body and gently kissed her lips. The sensation of softness transferred through the touch, and time seemed to freeze at that moment. They remained locked in the kiss for an unknown duration before parting. After the altar department, the spring planting of the new year finally began. This marked Roland's first step in exploring farming techniques. The serfs saw the dawn of becoming free citizens and worked with great enthusiasm. There were no overseers cracking whips to urge them on. The officials of the city hall stated that the Lord did not care about the harvest of one or two fields, the serfs were now working for themselves, and those who worked harder would reap more. Although these serfs were illiterate, Roland still insisted on lining the riverbank with flags and banners, he also required the serfs to repeat these messages. He never believed that serfs were foolish and irredeemable individuals. Just because they lacked education didn't mean they lacked thoughts and ideas. He knew that by giving them hope of becoming free citizens when they exchanged their bountiful crops for money, bought fine clothes, exquisite food, and even their own land and houses, those slogans would no longer be mere slogans. By relying on their own hands to escape poverty, they could become valued members of border town and perhaps even surpass a native of the town. 
As Roland didn't have time to study how to turn sand into glass, he could only burn the crystal bottles that the nobles considered precious and reshape them into what he needed. Nightingale couldn't understand Roland and Anna's conversation about chemistry and acidity, so she walked back to the center of the courtyard, took off her gloves, and picked up a piece of pastry from the round table. The table was filled with palace snacks specially made by the chefs for His Royal Highness. For example, there was a snack called Bowsy, made from wheat flour with a soft and chewy texture. Inside, there was a filling of finely chopped meat, which contained savory juices. Nightingale sucked on her fingers one by one, leaned back on the lounge chair, and slight drowsiness washed over her. The afternoon sunlight bathed her body, enveloping her in gentle warmth. The rustling sound of the spring breeze caressing the leaves brought a sense of tranquility to her heart. She took off her shoes, curled up her legs, and lay on her side. Nightingale shifted her head and looked at Anna. Anna was holding a newly crafted flat-bottomed cup and seemed to be engaged in a serious and focused conversation with His Royal Highness. Nightingale admired this woman who came from a commoner family yet possessed extraordinary talent. If His Royal Highness were to marry a witch, Anna would be the only candidate Nightingale could think of. Although she harbored a trace of expectation in her heart, Nightingale chose to bury it deeply. Most of the time, just being by His Royal Highness's side was enough to satisfy her. She closed her eyes, and an image involuntarily appeared in her mind. Roland was crowned as the king in the grand hall of the palace. He wore a golden crown and held a jeweled scepter as he walked towards the terrace of the castle, receiving the admiration and cheers of the people. By his side, walking hand in hand, was a woman dressed in a long white silk gown Anna herself. She also wore a sparkling golden headdress, her face covered by a veil, smiling and waving to the people. Lightning twirled in the sky, showering crimson rose petals, while the distant clock tower of the capital city chimed melodiously. Nightingale and the other sisters stood on the side, applauding and offering their blessings. Roland turned around, lifted the woman's veil, and leaned down to kiss her lips. The final scene became blurred, and as the veil fell to the ground, Nightingale saw, in a trance, that the woman with closed eyes was herself. She curved her lips into a smile and sank into a dream. The three bishops solemnly announced the church's declaration of an all-out war against the Wolf Heart Kingdom. Bishop Maine, with his astute judgment, appointed priest Nyla as the envoy, entrusting her with a crucial mission. Alongside a formidable group of ten Judgment Army warriors, her mission is to investigate the border town, Priest Nyla possessed an extraordinary presence, enhanced by her unusually striking pair of knockers, as she departed, Bishop Heather couldn't help but wear a mischievous grin, subtly hinting at Maine's potential interest in Priest Nyla as a lover. Tafun sharply turned to face Heather, his eyes imploring her to treat the matter with utmost seriousness. Unperturbed by Heather's comment, Maine furrowed his brows, engrossed in contemplation. His mind wandered, questioning the truth behind the fourth prince's alleged connection with the witches. Considering Roland's debauchery history, it seemed plausible to entertain the notion that he had succumbed to the irresistible allure of these beautiful witches. Or could it be that the witches had cast their spell upon him, transforming him into their unwitting puppet? But end of the day, the rumor of Roland's recruitment of witches posed a direct challenge to the church's revered authority. The mission sent out by His Highness was completed, Tessa had visited many cities, searching for the black market and underground gangs, he spread the message among the denizens of the dark alleys in every city. As he walked back to the hotel, he sensed an unsettling atmosphere. He realized that he was being followed. Although the pursuer was discreet, Tassa noticed their presence, he reached for the dagger at his waist and turned into a nearby alley. Unexpectedly, the pursuer suddenly transformed into a wisp of mist, disappearing from sight. It's a witch. He realized, just as he was about to shout. But before he could speak, he received a powerful blow to the back of his neck. Instantly, he felt everything spinning, and he collapsed to the ground, overcome with weakness. When Tassa regained consciousness, he felt a sharp pain at the back of his neck. He opened his eyes and attempted to move, only to realize that his hands were securely bound behind his back and his legs were spread apart, tied to the legs of two chairs. 
The pink-haired woman kicked the chair and held a sword against Tassa's throat. Tassa glanced forward, uncertain if he was looking at her underwear or the sword. The woman demanded to know why he was searching for witches, Tassa recalled the words of the prince, advising him to claim affiliation with the witch association, when faced with such a situation. With the sword mere millimeters away from his forehead, Tassa didn't hesitate to say that he was from the witch association. It's all nonsense. She said sharply. A woman in black approached with a large sword behind her back, clearly not believing Tassa's words. Tassa, in a suppressed voice that wanted to shout but dared not, quickly explained that he was telling the truth. The members of the witch association had settled in the border town, and everyone was safe. He had come to spread the information so that more witch companions could find them. Tassa even mentioned the name of the mentor, Wendy, and Scroll. After listening, the woman fell silent for a moment. Her attitude had softened compared to before. She instructed the other two witches to leave tonight on a boat with the rest of the witches and told one of the girl to deliver the message to Tilly that she would meet her later. Lightning soared through the sky above the enchanted forest. At this moment, she was on a grand adventure, searching for the ruins of 450 years ago in the depths of the forest. Half a month ago, when she heard about the mission entrusted to her by Roland, Lightning immediately accepted without hesitation. She knew His Highness was absolutely right. Even a castle, after more than 400 years, would be consumed by the overgrowth of plants and gradually reduced to a pile of dust. However, she still wanted to find this place and confirm the location of the hexagram. Following the method of creating a nautical chart, Lightning drew a grid with equal distances on a square parchment. Then, based on the distance she flew within a certain period of time, she roughly deduced the contents to be filled in each grid. When the grid was filled, it meant the area had been thoroughly searched. The approaching speed of the rain clouds behind her was faster than lightning had imagined. The young girl could faintly hear the thunder rumbling within the layers of clouds. She descended in altitude and swiftly glided towards the forest below. After a few seconds, she suddenly caught sight of a small portion of a white stone tower amidst the branches. The top of the tower had been completely sheared off, causing it to be concealed by the surrounding trees and difficult to detect in the sky. If it weren't for evading the rain clouds, she would likely have missed it. She circled around the stone tower once but found nothing unusual, so she decided to get closer and investigate. Logically, she should have recorded the location of the ruins and then returned to Border Town. Various adventurous stories in her mind reminded her that it was not a wise choice to venture alone into a dormant ruin that had been slumbering for hundreds of years. Even the toxic gases trapped underground could take her life. All right. She told herself, flying in the rain is uncomfortable, so I'll seek shelter in the tower to escape the rain and take a peek inside. If I discover an underground chamber, I absolutely won't go in alone. After considering her options, Lightning succumbed to her overwhelming curiosity and approached the entrance, entangled with vines. She drew a small knife from her waist, clearing a small hole for herself to pass through, and crawled inside. The wooden door had long corroded, allowing her smooth entry into the tower. Suddenly, she faintly heard a cry, mixed with the sound of rain, making it almost indistinguishable. This sound immediately sent shivers down her spine, and the young girl anxiously surveyed her surroundings. At that moment, the cry resounded once again, this time seemingly coming from behind the wooden door behind her. Lightning couldn't help but tremble. This time, the voice seemed much clearer, and she vaguely recognized it as a woman's voice. The voice indeed came from behind the wooden door, sounding as if it was pleading for help. Lightning swallowed nervously and cautiously placed her hand on the door, gently pushing it. The damp and slippery wooden door tilted backward, crashing to the ground with a dull thud. A tall figure suddenly appeared in front of her. Lightning felt her entire body freeze as the figure resembled the demon depicted in Soroya's painting. In the dim light, the demon seemed to be staring at her, its massive body slightly leaning forward. In its three-fingered hand, it held an axe with dark red stains reflecting off its blade. In an instant, graphic images of these brutal demons slaughtering her sisters from the witch association flooded her mind. Ah! She erupted into a scream of terror. 
After the tour of the steam engine, Roland and Margaret returned to the castle office to continue discussing the details of their trade agreement. Margaret was extremely fond of the steam engine and wanted to buy ten of them for five thousand gold royals. Roland was conflicted because he didn't want to sell, but Margaret's offer was quite substantial. Margaret wore the God Punishment necklace, and Nightingale was unable to use her lie detecting ability on her. The two sides negotiated well, and Roland also hoped that Margaret could provide iron, copper, lead, and other minerals, Margaret agreed to the request. Suddenly, her face changed dramatically, and she looked behind Roland with astonishment. He hesitated for a moment, then subconsciously turned his head. There, he saw lightning, completely drenched, clinging to the window, her hands gripping the glass. Her face was filled with panic and pale, strands of wet hair sticking to her forehead, droplets falling down as if she had just been pulled out of water. Roland quickly stood up and opened the window. After lightning flew into the room, she rushed into Roland's arms, her anxious expression instantly relaxing, and her body went limp as she fainted. He turned his head and shouted to Carter, quickly, call Nanoa. He said urgently. Margaret covered her mouth and approached the prince, carefully examining the young girl in his arms. Roland's heart sank. Damn it, how could he forget about her? He yelled loudly towards the door. Shane. The guard walked into the office in response. Roland ordered Shane to escort Margaret to the first floor living room for supervision. What? No, your highness, please wait. She said panicky but was interrupted by Shane and let out of the office. Roland anxiously waited outside the door, while Wendy, Leaf, and Nanawa took care of the unconscious lightning by the bedside. Wendy sat at the head of the bed, gently combing through the young girl's still slightly damp hair. The previously pale-faced lightning now had a hint of rosy color. Suddenly, lightning opened her eyes and sat up. Roland walked to the bedside and asked with concern what had happened. I found the ruins. She muttered softly. But there's a devil inside. These words caused everyone's expression to change. Scroll pushed aside Roland and anxiously asked if Lightning had gone inside. Lightning shook her head and recounted the events. She felt downhearted because she heard someone calling for help, but the demon guarding the basement was too terrifying, so she could only choose to escape. She whispered, questioning if she can still be called an explorer. Roland comforted her, saying that Lightning's decision was correct. Excellent adventurers and explorers know how to assess the situation and don't intentionally put themselves in danger. Everyone began to analyze who might have called for help and how to reach them. Roland interrupted them, saying that they would only know by going to see for themselves. In any case, the fact that lightning returned safely was enough. Outside the window, the sound of rain had subsided, and the clouds were tinged with a reddish hue as the sun was about to set. Roland pushed open the door to the ground floor guest room, where Margaret was pacing in front of the fireplace, looking somewhat uneasy. The guard, Shane, who had been standing by, saluted and left upon seeing the prince, while Margaret hurriedly approached him, anxiously asking. Your Highness, how is lightning? Roland was taken aback, envisioning various possible reactions from Margaret, ranging from calmness to anger to indifference, but he didn't anticipate her first question to be this. Roland apologized for his earlier offense and explained why he had asked her to remove the God Punishment necklace. Margaret expressed understanding and sat across from Roland. She then mentioned that Lightning is a witch, seemingly very excited about it. Margaret stood up and slammed the table, remarking that she truly is the daughter of Lord Thunder. After she calmed down, she assured Roland that she wouldn't report Lightning, and she sighed before explaining her relationship with Lightning. Margaret at the age of 18, joined Thunder's exploration team and met Thunder and his wife during that time. Thunder discovered several islands and lands, and he drew maps of them. Lightning was born on the ship, but unfortunately, shortly after giving birth to Lightning, Lady Thunder passed away due to sepsis. As the only female crew member in the fleet, Margaret took on the role of Lightning's surrogate mother, feeding her, playing with her, and taking care of her. As the days went by, lightning grew, the journey came to an end, and Margaret's family decided to settle down and move to Grey Castle for business. 
A few years later, Margaret heard the news that Thunder's fleet had perished at sea in a storm, with no survivors. However, Margaret didn't believe it. As Roland listened to Margaret's story, he realized that she didn't seem to harbor any prejudice against witches. Margaret mentioned that witches are beautiful and have magical abilities, making them the best waifu. However, due to the risks involved in the capital city, she couldn't provide shelter for witches. Upon hearing this, Roland found a kindred spirit in Margaret. Margaret also expressed her curiosity about whether Roland had taken in other witches and expressed her interest in getting to know them. It seems that Margaret has a fascination with witches and a positive attitude toward them, and asked to meet all of them. Tassa climbed up a small hill and could faintly see the outline of the border town, he circled around the hill and quickly found his target, a flagpole with a red cloth hanging from it. From the muddy ground near the flagpole, and replaced the previous red flag with a neatly folded blue cloth. Sitting down in a nearby spot, Ash extended her hand for food. Tassa opened his backpack, took out a piece of dried meat, tore off half of it for himself, and threw the rest to Ash. Seeing the witch chewing on the jerky, Tassa sighed. Although he finally knew her name, apart from a large sword, Ash didn't even have a single copper eagle on her, despite being penniless, she dared to boldly join him on the journey to the border town. Tessa paid for all the accommodation and meals along the way. The rooms had to be top-notch single bedrooms, and the food had to be neat. Even portable food like dry rations had to be tested by Tessa first. Ash threatened that if the visitor wasn't a witch, this would be Tessa's grave. Swallowing the jerky, Ash suddenly mentioned that her companions had already boarded a ship to the fjord. Tassa knew about the fjord, and it was an extremely harsh environment. Ash said that they had established a witch's sanctuary there. When Tassa heard the name of their leader, he was shaken. It was Tilly Wimbledon, the fifth princess of Greycastle. At that moment, Ash suddenly stood up and stared in the direction of the small road. Tassa followed her gaze, and the figures of a group of people gradually appeared in the darkness. The leading witch was none other than the prince's personal guard, Nightingale. As the group entered the border town, Ash noticed something amiss. The members of the witch association were holding torches, boldly walking down the streets. Even after nightfall, the town was not shrouded in silence. Dim lights flickered through the paper windows of many households, and if one listened carefully, one could hear the distant sound of children reading aloud. Candles, although not excessively expensive, were not to be used lightly due to the limited savings of the common folk. It was an incredible sight to see so many households in the town lighting candles at night, coupled with the sound of each word being read aloud. Could it be that they were teaching children how to recognize words? Winding their way through the intersecting streets, the group drew closer to the castle area. Ash could already see the dark walls and the guards standing watch in the night. She couldn't help but slow her pace, recalling what the witches had told her about their work contract with the Lord and how this place was their home. Passing through the castle gates, it became apparent that the guards were accustomed to the presence of the witches, exchanging greetings with one another. Inside the Grand Hall, Ash witnessed even more witches. They seemed to have been awaiting their arrival for some time, as they erupted into applause upon seeing them. Nightingale took a couple of steps forward preparing to give a brief introduction when suddenly, a witch dashed towards them. Ash noticed the movement but didn't take any defensive measures. She could sense the surprise and joy in the witch's actions, but there was no hostility. Soon enough, a warm body jumped to hug her. In the second-floor bedroom, only Ash and Wendy remained. Ash hadn't expected to encounter her companion from the monastery here. Calling Wendy a companion felt somewhat weird, if it hadn't been for that fateful night, Ash would never have crossed paths with Wendy. In fact, she hadn't even noticed the hidden room beneath the ground, where another unfortunate soul, Wendy, had been forcibly brought in. Nor did she expect Wendy to also awaken as a witch. Ash told Wendy how she had killed the pursuing judgment soldiers and enforcers that night until the God Punishment Army arrived. The God Punishment Army was the church's elite warriors, specifically trained to combat extraordinary witches like her. The scars on Ash's eyes were a testament to that encounter. Speed, strength, and an ability to not feel pain. 
they were born weapons of slaughter. As Wendy tried to console Ash, saying that she could stay here and live a normal life with all the other sisters, mentioning how kind the fourth prince was to them, Ash crushed the cup in her hand, but the sharp glass fragments did not cut her. She slammed her hand onto the table, her eyes fixed on Wendy, and asked each word with intensity. You were taken in by Roland Wimbledon, weren't you? Upon hearing Wendy's confirmation, Ash grabbed her hand and headed towards the door. In her memories, Roland was despicable beyond measure. She gritted her teeth, wishing she could chop him into pieces. Wendy asked Ash to let go of her, and after a moment of silence, she spoke up, saying, I can't speak for the other sisters, but I won't leave the border town. Prior to meeting Ash, Roland had already received a detailed report from Tessa. He never expected that the long-lost Tilly Wimbledon had become the leader of another witch organization and had even managed to gather a significant portion of the witches within the Grey Castle Kingdom before him. What he couldn't tolerate was the fact that she now had her sights set on his own territory. According to Nightingale's information, the witch before him was extraordinary, her abilities likely leaned towards a combat-oriented type. Roland knew that any extraordinary deserved cautious treatment. Therefore, when he received Ash in his office, aside from the invisible nightingale, Anna stood by his side. In front of the desk, there were several incredibly thin black flames forming an imperceptible wall, ready to cut her into pieces should she dare to charge forward. Roland and Ash engaged in a fierce argument. Roland claimed that the witches in the border town stayed there willingly and that it was their best destination, he believed the fjord to be highly dangerous, with constant storms and tsunamis, not to mention the perilous journey across the sea. In his opinion, it was unsuitable for habitation. However, Ash was certain that Tilly would lead them to the fjord where they could be safe from the church's interference and create their own home. She believed that Roland's spreading of information to locate the witches would only invite trouble upon himself. Having heard the intel of the God Punishment Army by Wendy, Roland knew that persuading Ash through displays of power would be more effective than mere words. Of course, he could choose to ignore Ash altogether, but that would mean giving up on any chance of winning over the witches under Tilly Wimbledon's command. Despite the slim hope, he still wanted to give it a try. How many members of the God Punishment soldiers can you simultaneously handle? He asked. Ash's expression appeared somewhat puzzled, but ultimately she extended three fingers and said she could handle three of them. Roland sat up straight and told Ash. Let's make it more interesting then. Ash was momentarily stunned, and for the first time, a different expression appeared on her icy face. Roland proposed a fair one-on-one -on -one duel. Ash gave him a look that said. Are you out of your mind? Roland decided to entrust this honorable task to Carter. The competition was scheduled for one week later, and Roland invited Ash to freely explore the border town during that time hopefully she could change her prejudice. Just as she turned to walk towards the door, Roland suddenly called out to her. Wait, have I seen you somewhere before? Although he was certain he hadn't seen that face before, there was a strangely familiar feeling emanating from the figure's back. Roland took a brief moment to recollect, and the familiarity seemed to originate from within the royal palace. If it wasn't for Tilly stopping me, you would have been left with only one hand back in the palace. Ash remarked. As the office door closed, Nightingale and Anna both turned to look at Roland. Nightingale asked. Did you also grope her butt? Roland blushed. What you mean also? Anna interrupted their conversation and asked Roland if he was confident in having the knight defeat the extraordinary witch. Roland was full of confidence because he had his secret weapon. He had long been envisioning the design of a revolving firearm. Round lead bullets and loose gunpowder were simply too outdated. He hoped to create a firearm capable of rapid fire. Kyle Sichi, with unwavering determination, embarked on a commercial ship bound for the border town, along with his family and over a dozen disciples. Leaving behind the alchemy workshop in the city of Crimson Water, he penned a farewell letter to his disciple Charles, resolute in his decision to venture to the border town. Just a few days prior, emissaries from Roland had arrived, seeking to recruit alchemists, accompanied by some fantastical formulas that pushed the boundaries of imagination. 
Kyle had always believed that the essence of alchemy lay in seeking truth amidst the chaos, but little did he expect that the fourth prince would offer him a revelation unlike any other. The direct current generator and the direct current motor have no structural differences. Essentially, they are the same thing, and their functions can be interchangeable. As long as other machines drive the rotor of the motor to rotate and continuously cut magnetic lines with the help of the conductor, an induced current can be generated continuously. With the assistance of Mystery Moon, aka Ram, and Anna, Roland was able to assemble a simple direct current motor in just a few hours. The stator part was entirely made of wood and then imparted with Rem's magnetism ability. The commutator segments were embedded in a piece of round wood, which had a central hole for connecting it to the steam engine shaft. This construction was not only convenient to manufacture but also ensured insulation between the commutator segments. Kyle finally met the fourth prince, inside the reception hall of the castle, after exchanging greetings, Kyle couldn't contain his excitement and eagerly wanted to learn more about the alchemical formulas. He could hardly believe that Roland had authored those formulas himself. Roland attributed his knowledge to ancient texts dating back 400 years. This revelation left Kyle even more bewildered. After all, the alchemical association in the capital had a history of less than 200 years. Did this mean that later generations were inferior to their predecessors? Roland explained to Kyle that in the book, the scholars from 400 years ago referred to alchemy as chemistry. They put forth a hypothesis that matter is indestructible. The substances that make up everything in the world do not disappear or increase, they merely transform from one form to another. Roland offered an apt analogy, but it didn't immediately convince Kyle. Kyle then posed a question, if a piece of wood is burned to powder, no matter how it is measured, the weight of the powder is lighter than that of the wood. If the matter is indestructible, where did the missing material go? Roland smiled and explained that it transformed into gas and water. The water evaporated due to the heat of the flame, leaving behind only the residue. Kyle found it hard to believe that gas also has weight. Roland took out a beginner's chemistry book from his desk and offered Kyle a job, with the same salary as in Crimson Water City, but with the requirement to sign a confidential agreement. Barov, who had been lurking in the background, suddenly appeared, startling Kyle. Roland's first task for Kyle was to create a highly concentrated acid. Nightingale emerged from the mist, pouting her little mouth, she accused Roland of deception. She knew that the introductory chemistry book was not some ancient text from 400 years ago but rather something Roland had written himself. Roland knew that instead of directly telling Kyle the truth, it would be better to let him delve into it on his own and experiment because people always believe in themselves the most. Suddenly, Titangale lowered herself, leaning towards Roland, and asked who had taught him all this knowledge. Before Roland could respond, Nightingale pressed her finger against his lips, saying, If you don't want to say it, then don't. I don't want to hear you lie. The prince handed over a peculiar-looking firearm, and Carter received it with both hands. The trigger and barrel resembled those of a flintlock musket, leading the knight to conclude that they belonged to the same type of weapon. It was not particularly large, but it felt surprisingly heavy in his hands, even more so than a flintlock rifle. What caught his attention was that, apart from the wooden grip, the entire gun was made of metal. Its sleek lines, angles, and grey-white metallic sheen exuded an indescribable beauty. Carter almost instantly fell in love with the weapon, he quickly discovered that its operation was simpler than that of a flintlock. The projectiles and gunpowder were already combined, and all he had to do was load the revolving cylinder in the middle to fire. The cylinder had five holes, allowing for the simultaneous loading of five rounds. Sparks and gases burst out from both sides of the cylinder, creating a deafening sound that made his ears ache. It felt as if someone had forcefully pushed him, causing his wrist to involuntarily rise. When the smoke cleared, the target appeared undamaged. Carter took a deep breath, firing the remaining four bullets, yet not a single one hit the target. Carter looked towards His Royal Highness, and Roland appeared unfazed. Smiling, Roland explained that due to the shorter barrel, pistols have inferior range and accuracy compared to rifles, so missing the target was quite normal. 
Additionally, with a bullet caliber close to 12 mm, the recoil was much greater than that of a flintlock. He reassured Carter that this was an unfinished prototype and that he needed Carter to practice continuously throughout the week. Before the competition, Carter must ensure that all five shots hit the target. Roland reminded Carter to remember to collect the spent casings. Carter looked at His Royal Highness and thought to himself, the prince is truly remarkable. Given time, he will undoubtedly ascend to the throne of Grey Castle. And I will do everything in my power to assist him. Ashes sat at the top of the castle, awaiting the day of the duel. As she gazed at the sunset, she felt a sense of helplessness. Over these past few days, her attempts to persuade the witch members had made no progress. Their stubbornness far exceeded her expectations. Whether they were the older, knowledgeable ones like Scroll or the young ones like Lily, they all rejected her invitation. The only difference was the manner in which they refused. Some chose to stay because of Roland, while others didn't want to leave their sisters. As for the small town, it was unlike any other town or village she had seen before. If she had to describe it, she would say that it was brimming with vitality. It seemed like the people here had endless tasks to accomplish every day. They always had a joyful smile on their faces, what kind of magic did Roland Wimbledon possess to ignite such enthusiasm among the townsfolk for building a desolate and barren little town? Just then, a chorus of cooing birds came from above. Ashes looked up and saw a giant, fat pigeon descending from the sky, landing on her shoulder. The pigeon nuzzled against her cheek. Ash asked if Tilly had sent her, and the pigeon cooed twice. Suddenly, Ashes grinned and scattered some grains on the rooftop. The fat pigeon flapped its wings and flew over, as if realizing something, and pecked Ashes with its sharp beak. While saying, I'm not a bird. The feathers of the pigeon suddenly expanded, emitting a bright white light from between the gaps. Then, a head emerged, and the expanded feathers quickly shrank, transforming into a cascade of long white hair. No matter how many times Ashes witnessed it, she would always marvel at it. Maisie, a witch with the ability to transform into various birds, was exquisite in every detail, except for her enlarged size. Maisie was eager to meet the new witches, but Ashes sighed and briefly explained the situation. She told Maisie that the witches here didn't want to leave. Maisie thought that since Roland was Tilly's brother and they were both willing to accept witches, it was a good thing. However, Ashes shook her head and mentioned the upcoming duel in a few days. Ashes knew that even if she won, the witches here wouldn't leave. But she still wanted to give it a try. Maisie understood and suddenly remembered seeing a group of about ten people on horseback carrying the banners of the church when she flew over a nearby city. Ashes let out a cold snort and said, apart from the border town, I don't think there's any other place nearby that would require the church to send an envoy. Their noses are as sensitive as dogs. Well, let them witness me cleanly defeat their knight. Then I'll tell them the news of the church's arrival. By then, Roland Wimbledon will know just how wrong he was. Above the border town, lightning soaring through the skies, while wearing a pair of wind goggles that Roland made for her, ensuring that no matter how fast she flew, the wind wouldn't sting her eyes. Lightning recalled Roland's comment about her resemblance to Ezreal, though she had no idea who Ezreal was. Suddenly, a white figure darted past the corner of her eye. She turned her head to see a pigeon spreading its wings and gliding through the sky, pigeons were not uncommon birds, but this one was different. It was an incredibly plump, barbecue pigeon. Without hesitation, lightning changed direction and charged toward the pigeon. The pigeon quickly noticed the unexpected pursuer and dove down, seemingly trying to escape into the nearby forest to shake off its relentless hunter. They raced through the woods and swiftly crossed an open clearing. Lightning seized the opportunity, pushed her speed to the limit, and in an instant, she pounced on the pigeon, pinning it to the ground. The pigeon struggled but couldn't break free from her grip. Lightning drew a small knife from her waist, ready to finish off her prey. But then, the pigeon unexpectedly spoke, don't. Help me, coo. The pigeon inflated into a ball and transformed into a human. Startled, Lightning was startled, nearly dropping her knife in fright. However, she quickly regained her composure. 
You're a witch, she asked. Nazi nodded repeatedly, confirming that she was indeed a witch. Lightning helped Maisie to her feet, and they introduced themselves to each other. Along the way, Maisie pointed to the pendant hanging around Lightning's neck. It was a tracking rune, used for locating purposes. Maisie appeared slightly annoyed because Lightning had just contemplated eating her, however, Maisie quickly explained that only witches could use the tracking rune, and it required a matching magic stone to pinpoint a specific location. Lightning's pendant was given to her by her father when she was a child. Within a few minutes, Lightning and Maisie seemed to have become the best of friends. They flew towards the mystery forest, gathering mushrooms and soaring above the castle. In the evenings, they studied together. As the days went by, the day of the duel drew closer. The weapons were still being improved, and Carter continued his training. He had become familiar with the handgun and was now able to hit the target consistently. On the eve of the duel, as the sky grew dark, Ash finally waited for Maisie to return to her room. Ash was busy cleaning her large blade when she asked Maisie why she had been returning so late in the past few days. Maisie transformed back into human form and pulled out a roasted bird leg from her pouch. The room was instantly filled with its irresistible aroma. It was a bird that Lightning and she had roasted together, and Maisie wanted to share it with Ash. Ash shook her head and was surprised to learn that Maisie also enjoyed eating birds. Maisie asked if the duel was really necessary. She knew that the witches here would never leave, and the border town is so comfortable that even she herself even wanted to stay. The prince would dine with the witches, laughing and joking together, and the people in the town didn't discriminate against witches. Plus, the witches here could play Gwent with her and keep her company. Most witches live in constant fear and uncertainty, and a stable and comfortable place to live is all they strive for. Take Maisie, for example. Before being accepted by Tilly, she had been hiding in a thatched hut in the slums of the capital city, curling up in the narrow gaps between the roof beams like a true bird, spending each night in fear. Even when Tilly decided to journey east across the sea, Maisie traveled tirelessly, reaching out to the hidden witches scattered throughout the land, without any breaks, she had likely never experienced such a peaceful and tranquil life before, Ash thought to herself. Ashes couldn't fathom such thoughts. She was terrified and there was no way she would leave Tilly's side. She confided in Maisie, revealing that this place was constantly under the looming threat of the church, unable to withstand the wrath of the God Punishment Army. The annihilation of the border town was merely a matter of time. What if they can resist? Maisie muttered under her breath. I hope so too, which is why I'll help them prove it, Ashes said solemnly. The following day. Apart from Roland, the spectators included Axe, Brian, and all the members of the Witch Alliance. In addition, there was a fat pigeon perched on Roland's head, Carter was not dressed in his usual knight's armor but instead wore a fitted leather jacket for ease of movement. He had a specially customized gun holster around his waist, with a revolver tucked into each side. A short knife was also holstered at his lower back. Roland had echo mimic and amplify his voice, saying, The rules of the contest are simple, touch and stop, no headshots, and you can surrender. As long as you don't die on the spot, Nanawa's healing abilities can quickly heal you. Any questions? He waited a moment, seeing no objections from the two, and continued, When you hear the bell, the contest begins. Ashes, still dressed in her usual attire, wore a black robe that concealed her body. Her long black hair was tied back in a ponytail. Ashes silently assessed her opponent, Carter, the chief knight. However, he didn't carry the typical sword, shield, or spear, and he wasn't even wearing armor. The weapon in his hand was extremely peculiar, leaving only one possibility, it must be similar to a crossbow, a long-range weapon. Ashes had learned from numerous battles that a crossbow posed no threat to extraordinary witches. If it were a light crossbow, she could even catch the bolts with her bare hands. However, judging by the confident look on the prince's face, the weapon in his hand was definitely not as simple as a crossbow. Just then, a clear bell rang from the city walls. Almost simultaneously, Ashes made her move. Gripping the hilt of her sword with both hands, 
she forcefully lifted it forward, causing dirt, grass, and debris to fly into the air, creating a cloud of dust and sand in the direction of the knight. The chief knight's reaction was equally swift. His weapon burst into flames and emitted a deafening roar. Taking advantage of the cover provided by the dust and sand cloud, Ashes launched a sprint from the side. In the blink of an eye, the distance between them was reduced by half. However, Carter did not move from his position, completely disregarding the sand that had hit his face. Squinting his eyes, he aimed his weapon at the approaching extraordinary witch. Once again pulling the trigger. With a thunderous boom accompanied by a burst of fire, Ashes reflexively took a step to the side. In the final moments, the remaining ten steps were covered in the blink of an eye. She held her long sword upright in front of her and forcefully pushed off the ground with her feet, charging towards the knight like a bull. The third attack from Carter's gun detonated before Ash's eyes. She felt a powerful jolt through her sword, emitting a crisp buzzing sound, followed by a numbing sensation in her right abdomen as if something had viciously grabbed her. Almost simultaneously, she collided with Carter's chest, sending him flying in the air, tracing an arc before crashing to the ground. Only at this moment did she have the opportunity to examine the injury around her waist. However, as soon as she lowered her head, a strong dizziness surged to her brain. She staggered for a moment, nearly falling to the ground. The power that had flowed through her body seemed to have vanished like water, and her limbs became incredibly heavy. Ashes used her long sword to support her body. The numbness of the wound had transformed into an intense burning pain. It felt as if a part of her waist was missing, and she could even see her own vivid red organs. Only by gritting her teeth could she prevent herself from collapsing. Even though she was severely injured, she didn't faint. She stood on the field, displaying the terrifying resilience of an extraordinary witch. If it had been regular bullets or small-caliber rounds, she might have been able to endure them with her body alone. Maisie rushed to Ash's side as quickly as possible, wanting to support her, but due to her petite stature, she could only embrace Ash's legs, her face filled with anxiety. Nanawat was already attending to Carter's treatment, while Roland quickly approached Ash's, who was still holding on with the great effort. It seemed that she had been waiting for this moment. I won. Ashes managed to say before collapsing onto Roland's shoulder. On a street, a woman bumped into a pedestrian. Someone forcefully pushed her, but she remained unmoved, instead watching as the person stumbled back two steps. The arrogant expression instantly disappeared from his face. After giving her a fierce glare, the person begrudgingly walked away. Most people frowned and avoided the woman in tattered clothes. And so, she slowly made her way to the entrance of the inner city gates of Grey Castle, the capital. Pedestrians were discussing the princess's coming-of-age ceremony, rumored to be attended by the archbishop as well. Ashes checked her dagger, which she carried with her. Suddenly, a thunderous cheer erupted from the crowd, interrupting her thoughts. She looked towards the inner city area where the kingdom's night order was slowly approaching in a neat formation. The knights at the front were dressed immaculately, shining in golden armor. He royal descendants began to jump off the carriages one by one. Slowly walking towards the central podium were probably the five children of King Wellington III. Among these people, Ashes spotted Princess Tilly Wellington. There was no doubt that Princess Tilly was the protagonist of today. Her eyes sparkled with a lively light, as transparent as gemstones. Her simple side parted bangs complemented her refreshing gray hair, devoid of any adornments. Her beauty stood out among her siblings. The patterns on her dress were not intricate but perfectly matched her demeanor. And most incredibly, she actually looked past the crowd and directly locked eyes with ashes. Then, she nodded slightly as if greeting her, a smile appearing on her lips. It was definitely not an illusion. In that fleeting moment, ashes felt the same sensation. It was an overwhelmingly familiar feeling, as if they had been friends for years, warm and sweet. It didn't come from blood ties, identity, or status, but from a resonance of magic. After the ceremony, two guards found her and escorted her to the palace. In a secluded chamber, she stood before Princess Tilly. 
After listening to Ash's experience, Princess Tilly gently touched her face and bestowed upon her the name Ashes, inviting her to follow her in the future. Ashes opened her eyes, and the first thing she saw was Maisie's face. Maisie blinked her eyes and then hugged her tightly. Ashes tried moving her fingers and didn't feel the expected weakness or numbness. There was no sharp pain coming from her waist either. She lifted Maisie and knew that Nanola had used her healing abilities to cure her. Ashes put on her black robe glanced at the sky outside the window and walked towards the door. In the office, Ashes saw Roland again. He was engrossed in writing, presumably dealing with governmental affairs. It wasn't until the prince set down his quill that Ashes spoke up, I won. Indeed, you won, Roland nodded. His straightforward attitude surprised her a little. She had expected Roland to be more argumentative, but he seemed to accept the outcome. Ashes acknowledged Roland's ability to fight off the God Punishment Army, and she was curious about the weapon Carter had used. Roland mentioned it was a semi automatic pistol, and that his soldiers would be equipped with such weapons in the future. Even unarmed farmers could defeat a well trained judgment soldier with a firearm. Ashes hesitated for a moment and asked if she could have one. Only if you join the Witches' Alliance, Roland shrugged, after all, these things are still very rare at the moment. Her refusal was expected, and Ashes had come to bid farewell. She intended to return to the fjord and informed Roland that he could seek refuge there as well. Roland smiled and told Ashes to convey the same message to his sister. The border town was also a place where witches could find sanctuary. Ashes smiled and said she would consider it. Just as she was about to leave the office, the prince called her back, wanting to give her a gift. She paused, turned around, and saw a massive sword placed by the door. It was a sword crafted by Anna, made of pure steel. The sword had a smooth and even surface, reflecting an orange-red metallic luster under the setting sun. Ashes walked closer, gently caressing the great sword. She liked it very much and, before leaving, she mentioned that she would give Roland a gift in return as a gesture of gratitude. A female knight came into the priest's tent, the knight remarked that they could obtain information by capturing and interrogating a few villagers from the border towns, without needing to see the lord. Nyla smiled and replied, seeing the lord is inevitable. If he truly harbors witches, he will be executed on the spot. But if the rumors are false, the church will continue to cooperate with him. Suddenly, a cry rang out, enemy attack. The knight's tranquility shattered as the camp erupted in chaos. The female knight strode towards the front of the tent, only to be met with a thunderous blast. All the knights lay on the ground, while the female knight. Blood gushed into the air, illuminated by the flickering flames of the campfire. The female knight collapsed weakly to her knees, her body splitting apart and slowly falling to the sides, coming to rest at the feet of a woman. The priest trembled in fear, entire body shaking, while Ashes caught sight of a fallen book on the table, stirring painful memories of the past. She and those innocent little girls had all been deceived by that very book. With a mighty swing of her greatsword, she lunged toward the priest. Ashes buried the bodies, knowing that the secrets of the witches' alliance would eventually be exposed. However, this act bought them two or three months of time. Maisie caught the pigeons that connected the envoy and the church, and they roasted and ate them, this was a macabre gift from Ashes to Roland. There was one thing Ashes didn't mention, by doing this, she had essentially made the decision for the prince. When the church discovered the envoy's loss of contact, they would undoubtedly blame Roland. Even if he wanted to betray the witches, he wouldn't have the opportunity. With everything in order, the sky was gradually turning pale on the horizon. Ashes reached out and gently stroked Maisie's head, telling her that it was time to part ways here. Ashes knew Maisie loved this place, and Maisie lowered her head, showing a hesitant expression. She also loved Tilly and Ash. Ash smiled and assigned Maisie a task to fly back once a month and inform them of what was happening in the border town, while also bringing back news to the border town, this way, they could establish a connection between the two sides. If the town ever faced danger, Maisie could help them escape Greycastle and head to the fjord. Roland invited the Eltec couple to join him for dinner. Like her husband, 
Eileen had also become a teacher. After chatting for a while, Eileen cautiously asked why Roland had sought them out. In truth, Roland wanted an experienced person to come and perform in a play. Being on stage and acting had always been her dream. Roland handed over three scripts, one titled Cinderella, describing a touching love story between a common girl and a prince. Another called Le Coq Chante à Minuit, which revolved around the rebellion of the lower class people. And the last one titled Witch's Diary, an original work by Roland and Scroll that told the story of three girls who awakened witches and together overcame their enemies. The unexpected return of Maisie to the border town surprised everyone, her return was warmly welcomed, and the Witch Alliance gained a new member. What deeply moved her was that the welcoming feast was held in the castle's backyard, where a long iron frame was adorned with a variety of meats, available for anyone to take and grill as they pleased. Maisie almost ate until she was stuffed before finally stopping. In the afternoon, Roland proceeded to test her abilities. Maisie's ability manifested as the power to transform into various birds provided that she had seen them before. The transformation consumed a significant amount of magic, allowing her to change forms consecutively four to five times a day. She could transform into sparrows, seagulls, parrots, and many more. However, Roland noticed that regardless of the bird she transformed into, her size would increase significantly. Furthermore, there was one aspect of Ash's plan that caught Roland's attention. What abilities did the numerous witches gathered by Tilly possess? If there were witches who could significantly improve farming efficiency, he didn't mind exchanging technology with them. Thus, Roland decided to write a lengthy letter to Tilly. He would first elaborate on the net Ural alliance between their two sides, then caution her about the church's desire to unify the continent. Expressing his willingness for mutual assistance, cooperation, and shared progress. He planned to have Maisie deliver the letter when she traveled to the fjord next month. In gratitude for Anna's tireless efforts over the past couple of weeks, Roland decided to give her a gift. He unveiled a burlap cloth, revealing a basket woven from vines in front of them. The top of the basket was connected to several hemp ropes, with a large canvas attached to the other end. As the balloon inflated completely and began to rise, the traction ropes slowly straightened. Roland was the first to flip into the basket, followed by Anna who was climbing in. With a gentle sway, a hot air balloon lifted off the ground, gradually ascending. Before long, they had surpassed the top of the castle, and the panoramic view of the town unfolded before them. Looking down from here, one could clearly see the rooftops of the castle, the bustling town under construction, the flowing crimson river from west to east, and the verdant farmland along the riverbanks. The way the border town looks now, it's all thanks to your efforts, Miss Anna. Upon hearing these words, Anna was stunned. After a moment, she leaned back and softly spoke, My mother died in a fire, and instead of perishing in the smoke and flames, I became a witch. For a long time, I believed that it was my awakening that caused the fire, and I despised myself for being a witch. When I was locked in the dungeon, I thought it might bring me relief, but you rescued me and taught me how to harness my abilities. I never imagined that fire, apart from bringing destruction and pain, could have so many uses. Anna paused for a moment. To have met you, I should have felt immensely content, but now I find that my thoughts have changed. Sometimes I feel a suffocating unease in my heart, longing for more. After the hot air balloon had stayed in the air for half an hour, it slowly descended into the castle courtyard. As soon as the prince climbed out of the basket, Scroll and Wendy immediately approached him, giving him a lecture and advising him not to take unnecessary risks. The prince made a couple of excuses before wisely changing the subject. The other witches also wanted to try the hot air balloon. Nightingale found it somewhat amusing and was about to join in when she suddenly froze in place. She saw Anna, carried out of the basket by Roland, with a twinkle in her eyes and a blush on her cheeks. The other witches clamored to ride in the hot air balloon as well. Soon enough, the balloon inflated again, and this time Anna and Nanawa soared into the sky. Nightingale stood on the outskirts of the crowd, gazing blankly as the hot air balloon became smaller and smaller. It was then that she realized why she had used her abilities in the courtyard. 
Glancing back at Wendy, who was looking around with a bewildered expression, Nightingale quickly walked away. After dinner, Nightingale returned to her bedroom, hugging her knees. Wendy entered the room and closed the door behind her. I saw everyone riding in the hot air balloon, but you sat alone on the side, Wendy said. It's nothing, Nightingale replied, turning over. Wendy sat on the edge of the bed, gently straightening her posture and staring at her for a while. I thought you were willing to confide in me about anything, Wendy said. Nightingale didn't want to share all these troubles because it would make her feel selfish, after all, the first witch his highness had met was Anna, not her. Whenever she felt lost, the first person she thought of was always Wendy, who would never let her down. With that in mind, she gently held Wendy's hand and briefly explained the situation. Nightingale repeated the question asked by Scroll that day, His Highness Roland will marry a witch, Nightingale suddenly opened her eyes and said each word deliberately, he said it himself. And he wasn't lying. Wendy suddenly grabbed Nightingale's arm and earnestly told her that this matter should not be revealed to anyone, not even the sisters of the witch alliance. Nightingale was puzzled, and Wendy explained that Roland would undoubtedly become the king, and a king must have offspring. A king without an heir would not be accepted. Whether Roland could become the king would determine the fate of all the witch sisters. Wendy pondered for a moment and asked Nightingale if she wanted to become the queen or continue guarding by Roland's side. Without hesitation, Nightingale replied that she naturally wanted to be by his side. Wendy smiled and said, there can only be one queen, but even if he ascends the throne, he still needs your protection. Do you understand what I mean? Nightingale blinked her eyes but did not answer. The Secret Chamber of the Hermes Grand Cathedral The ritual of divine punishment transformation is the knowledge that the Pope must possess. When Maine took over the Codex of Divine Punishment a year ago, it was equivalent to obtaining the qualification to be the next Pope. The two judgment soldiers lay on the transformation platform, and Maine recognized them. The guards came forward and blindfolded the two soldiers, securing their limbs firmly to the platform with wrist and ankle restraints. Then a witch was brought in and laid flat between the two soldiers. One succeeded, and one failed. Standing between the two transformation platforms was the highest leader of the church, Pope Oberlin. He wore a striking red robe with gold trim and a sparkling gemstone crown on his head. Maine hesitated for a moment and asked how many judgment soldiers they would need to defeat the demons. Pope Oberlin raised his hand to silence him, telling Maine that he was too impatient. As the next pope, all the questions would be answered in the hidden chamber at the top of the Holy Secretariat. For now, the more God judgment soldiers, the better. Soon, another muscular warrior prepared for the ritual. It was Tak Thor, a member of the Holy City Guards, who knelt on one knee, feeling immensely honored to participate in this ceremony. Simultaneously, a God punishment knight approached, cradling an 18-year-old witch raised by the church. The day before the sacrifice, she had been heavily sedated with copious amounts of dreamer's water, a potent sleeping potion. Shortly after, a delicate silver needle was carefully inserted into the witch's arm, and the reddish-brown fluid flowed through the tube encasing the needle, converging into a crystal basin below her. At the bottom of the basin lay a layer of pale blue god punishment stones, gradually being submerged by the crimson fluid until the entire basin was filled. Soon, the god punishment stones began to undergo a transformation. Looking through one side of the basin, one could witness the blue stones absorbing the blood. After approximately half an hour, the stones gradually melted away, leaving the once murky blood clear and transparent, changing its color from reddish-brown to sky-blue. The witch's body had been magically altered, imbuing her blood with enhanced organ and tendon capabilities. However, if this blood were used directly, it would instantly kill the recipient. Hence, the need for the God Punishment Stones to neutralize its effects before injecting it into the subject's undergoing conversion. Even so, this blood still damaged the recipient's consciousness, gradually eroding their emotions and intelligence, leaving behind only instincts and remnants of strong will. The surviving God Punishment Knights would possess enhancements comparable to ordinary individuals and would also possess anti-magic properties when not wearing the God Punishment Stones. 
As the blue liquid flowed slowly into the body of the Judgment Knights through the tubing, the veins in his arms and necks bulged, and his expressions contorted in a grimace, as if enduring immense pain. With the completion of the ritual, Maine could barely remain standing. He stumbled off the platform, awkwardly leaning against the wall of the Grand Hall. Tack had succeeded, becoming the 62nd God Punishment Knight of the Year. Before Maine left, Pope Oberlin entrusted him with the latest development, a newly developed poison that, when sprinkled on decaying corpses, would have a long-lasting effect on the surrounding population, eliminating the need for direct ingestion like conventional poisons. Without a specific antidote, it was virtually incurable. In the forthcoming battles against the Four Kingdoms, it might prove to be a useful asset. Today, Anna and Soraya sat atop a hot air balloon, marveling at the scenery below. The basket they sat in was adorned with paintings, depicting an aerial view of the border town. However, unlike the previous photorealistic style, this time her paintings seemed to come alive, almost standing upright. Upon their return to the castle, Roland immediately summoned Soraya, and Nightingale confirmed the observation. Soraya's magic core has transformed, and the golden vortex of magical energy within Soraya's body had transformed. It had condensed into a continuously swirling ribbon. Soraya's painting had become more substantial and more vivid. The trees she painted appeared to be over a dozen centimeters thick. Soraya's abilities had evolved giving her a different perspective on her paintings. Roland thought the painting was more than just pigment, it seemed to be a coating composed of magic. Perhaps it could be applied to other things as well. Back in his office, Roland embarked on his new plan. He intended to use a steam engine to pump water from the Crimson Water River into the water tower and then utilize the principle of siphoning to distribute it through a pipeline to every household, creating an automated water supply system. Lately, Roland felt that Nightingale had been growing distant from him. He called her name a couple of times in the office, but there was no response. Suddenly, an evil grin appeared on his face as he reached for the snacks inside his desk. However, Nightingale intervened, stopping him in his tracks. Seeing Nightingale still by his side, Roland smiled and expressed his gratitude for her unwavering protection and companionship. Nightingale discovered a silver handgun in one of the drawers. The pistol gleamed with a polished surface, reflecting shadows, and both the handle and the barrel were adorned with exquisite engravings. The name to Veronica was inscribed on the barrel. This plan had been brewing in Roland's mind for a long time. Compared to the cumbersome and inconvenient muzzle-loading firearms, the newly developed revolver was considerably more refined. It maintained high levels of both safety and firing rate. With Nightingale's exceptional agility as a witch, one could only anticipate the power she could unleash with a firearm in her hands. Nightingale possessed great talent, quickly familiarizing herself with the handgun and exhibiting remarkable accuracy in hitting her targets. Suddenly, Roland patted Nightingale's shoulder and told her to remember to pull the trigger while shouting, It's high noon. Nightingale glanced at Roland and asked if it was necessary or simply his personal preference. She raised the handgun, took a deep breath, and effortlessly hit the bullseye. At that moment, she found her answer. She was his shield and his blade, guarding him by his side until the very end of her life, fearless and without regrets. The highly anticipated premiere of the play was fast approaching. As the Lord, Roland naturally had the best seat in the house. In the direction directly facing the stage, Carl had constructed a temporary wooden platform with three tiers, accommodating approximately a hundred people. Roland sat right in the middle of the third tier. On one side of him were the members of the Witch Alliance, with Anna seated right beside him, while on the other side were the representatives of the Merchant Guild, with Margaret being the closest. A chubby merchant named Hogg, who had already devoured his tenth giant dumplings, asked Roland if he could sell him the recipe. Another merchant held a mug in his hand, appreciating its elegant design and waterproof coating. He didn't want the regular fragile crystal cups and expressed his interest in purchasing some. Meanwhile, Lightning and Macy were competing for popcorn in the sky. Soon, everyone quieted down. There was no curtain, no opening speech. Only a wooden board separated the front stage from the backstage area. 
A group of people were about to perform a play on such a rudimentary stage. It was their first official performance in their lives. The story takes place in the capital of a kingdom, in the outskirts of the city, where a beautiful and kind-hearted girl resides. As the narrator's voice echoed, Eileen slowly walked onto the stage. She was dressed in a dirty gray robe, her hair unkempt and disheveled, and her face smudged with black ash. Swinging the broom in her hand, she meticulously swept the floor, occasionally bending down to wipe away stubborn stains with the edge of her robe. However, what Eileen never expected was that May had actually given up the leading role to her. May was the star of the Western Star Fortress Theater and a prominent figure in the troupe. At that moment, May made her entrance. This scene depicted the initial conflict between the wicked stepsisters and Cinderella. Under the sisters' bullying and humiliation, Cinderella could only respond with tears, hiding in the basement and silently crying in front of her mother's portrait. May's elevated demeanor, precise movements, and unhidden contempt in her eyes overwhelmed Eileen with a strong sense of oppression. May forcefully pushed her, and Eileen was supposed to pretend to fall. However, under May's icy gaze, she involuntarily took a few steps back and tripped over herself, falling to the ground with little cushioning. Her elbow collided with the stage floor, sending a sharp and burning pain through her arm. May's gaze no longer lingered on her, she walked to the center of the stage, facing the silent audience in the square, and began her monologue. May was too convincing, her disgust and disdain towards Eileen felt all too real. Even sitting here, one could sense her cold and heartless demeanor. Eileen was somewhat stunned. May's exquisite acting captured everyone's attention, but Eileen hadn't fully immersed herself in the performance. It wasn't until May finished her act and passed by her, with the flowing hem of her dress brushing against Eileen's face, that she snapped back to reality. The next scene began, Cinderella's stepsisters were going to attend the prince's banquet that night, while Cinderella was trapped in the basement, clad in dirty rags and without even a pair of shoes. Suddenly, smoke filled the stage, and a young girl emerged from it, introducing herself as a witch from the Witch Alliance. The audience displayed various expressions of surprise upon seeing the witch. The little witch was here to help the kind-hearted Cinderella. This was Roland's plan to adapt the original story, promoting the kindness of the Witch Alliance and subtly guiding the people to eliminate their prejudices against witches. Nanala's portrayal of the little witch was the perfect choice since she had already become an idol-level figure in the First Army. With a wave of her hand, the little witch conjured up a carriage and a set of exquisite evening gowns. The little witch informed Cinderella that the witch's magic could only last until midnight. The next scene began, the handsome prince strolled down the street, feeling bored with the royal banquet. The actor playing the prince was indeed handsome, but his expression seemed too rigid. Margaret commented on this, and Roland chuckled. Next, the prince and Cinderella danced together on stage. Suddenly, the chimes rang, and Cinderella quickly let go of the prince's hand and hurriedly made her way down to the stage. In her haste, she dropped her glass slipper. The prince searched from house to house in the outer city, finally arriving at Cinderella's home. The story had a happy ending. The atmosphere in the entire venue instantly exploded. Everyone erupted in excitement as they witnessed the embrace between the prince and Cinderella. Timely cannon fire sounded from outside the stage, elevating the atmosphere to its peak. The applause and cheers continued incessantly, merging into a harmonious symphony of celebration. The actors bowed and exited the stage as the final narration echoed, yet the applause from the audience showed no signs of stopping. Taking a deep breath, May changed her clothes and, with a stern face, was the first to leave the dressing room. Just as she descended the wooden stairs, a man suddenly approached her. He, too, had a tall and handsome stature, adorned in shining silver armor. He appeared to be a knight from the border town. Carrying a bouquet of flowers, the man introduced himself and praised May's performance, hoping to invite her for a drink. Meanwhile, in the Changu stronghold, Approximately 50 individuals approached, all dressed in armor, glistening under the midnight. Among the eight groups, four of them carried banners. Three of these banners bore the emblem of the Twin Towers, symbolizing the Grey Castle royal family, while the other banner displayed a horse head, 
which Petrov recognized as the insignia of the House of Or, from the Northern Territory. A man stepped forward from the ranks of the knights. It was Raymond, the envoy of King Timothy. Petrov took a deep breath, realizing what was going on, since the other party was not an imposter, he had no reason to turn away the envoy of the new king, as doing so would be tantamount to making an enemy of the Grey Castle. Of course, this news needed to be promptly conveyed to His Highness Roland. He dispatched his knights to the border town and ordered the gates to be opened. Standing at the city gates, he noticed that aside from the spirited ten or so individuals at the forefront of the group, the rest of the knights seemed worn out. They slouched on their horses, appearing as if they could collapse at any moment. The envoy's entourage was nothing more than a ruse. Among the fifty-person group, there were only thirteen true knights. The rest were mercenaries disguised as knights, under the influence of church pills, now more obedient than hounds and more ferocious than demons. This was the key to Raymond seizing control of the city gates. The following day, in the border town. The backyard water tank was already filled with water, and he turned on the tap, allowing the water to flow through the pipes. Roland introduced the faucet, explaining that they no longer needed to fetch water from the well and could now take baths every day. Lightning stuck out his tongue and licked the never-ending droplets of water. It tastes quite sweet, she remarked. Maisie stuck her head out from under lightning and followed suit. It's pretty sweet, Koo. Cool. Nanawa tried to bring her head closer, but Roland stopped her and explained that the water must be boiled before drinking. So, you spent a whole week in the castle just to make bathing more comfortable? Lily sneered and whispered, truly a noble who enjoys extravagance. Scroll intervened to stop Lily, but Roland waved his hand, indicating that he didn't mind. Shortly after the prince returned to his office, Scroll followed suit. She apologized once again, and Roland smiled, assuring her that he didn't mind at all. Scroll recounted Lily's story, explaining that she no longer easily trusted others after being deceived. Scroll also had the ability to sense magic, so she would disguise itself as a noblewoman wanting to adopt a child whenever passing through a town. At that time, Lily was locked up in a remote shelter, but when Scroll specifically requested to adopt her, they refused, stating that they only sold adult girls at that establishment. She grew suspicious and had Nightingale examine the account books in this place. It was discovered that in the past decade, a total of three witches had been found in the shelter, all of whom were sold to the church. Those with attractive appearances were sold to nobles, while those who went unnoticed were killed in the shelter's woods. However, when they attempted to disperse this group of girls, most of the people glared at them with anger, as if they had taken away their chance of being adopted by nobles. Lily was initially the same until Hakura took her on a trip to the woods behind the small building. There, she witnessed her friend who had falsely claimed to be chosen by a noble and left the shelter a month ago as well as several putrid pits. From that point on, she became wary and mistrustful of ordinary people, especially nobles. Roland felt a deep sense of regret in his heart, vowing never to let the country he ruled become like this. Scroll remained silent for a long time before finally speaking up and asking Roland a question. Her expression turned serious, and she looked up, glancing to the side, asking if Nightingale was present as well. Nightingale materialized, asking if she should leave. Scroll shook her head, and then she turned its gaze toward Prince Roland. It brought up Roland's statement earlier about wanting to marry a witch, but Scroll wanted to make it clear to Roland that witches cannot bear children. She wanted to know if even knowing this, if he would change his mind. Roland hadn't anticipated that witches would be so concerned about his marriage. He asked Scroll if the inability of witches to bear children might be due to some misconceptions. Scroll sighed, regretfully confirming that many examples had proven this point. Whether in normal relationships with ordinary people or under coercion, there were no instances of witches being able to have children. In Roland's mind, he wondered if it was because witches had surpassed ordinary humans, making it impossible for them to conceive offspring with ordinary people. However, now was not the time for delving into the root cause. The key was the impact it would have on his desire to marry a witch. The first person he thought of was Anna. Though it was somewhat regrettable that he couldn't have children with her, his love for her was not dependent on having children. 
Furthermore, as someone with a modern soul, the importance of bloodline inheritance, emphasized by ancient people, was not as significant to him. As an individual with his own separate life, he didn't consider children as an extension of himself. Emotionally, he could fully accept the fact that witches couldn't bear children. The only remaining obstacle was the practical issue of an heir. However, for Roland, who had a broad perspective on history, this was not a particularly difficult matter. He simply needed to establish a democratic empire that didn't rely on having an heir. There were many options for implementing this, and he could consider them at a later time. Perhaps Roland had been lost in his thoughts for too long, as Nightingale couldn't help but grab his arm. Roland snapped out of his reverie and comfortingly patted her hand. He cleared his throat and said, I thought this way before, and I still think so now. He coughed twice and continued, I still think so now, I am willing to marry a witch. The expression on Scroll's face, as she departed, was strange, a mix of contentment and a hint of sadness, leaving Roland puzzled. He turned to Nightingale beside him and inquired, but she only smiled and turned away, keeping her back to Roland. Just then, there was a knock on the office door. Carter entered, bringing news that the Changu stronghold had been occupied and Petrov had been captured. Timothy's envoy had successfully breached the cathedral of Changji stronghold. The soldier's eyes glowed crimson, having consumed the drugs given by the church. The leading knight swiftly dispatched the priest with a single stroke. In the basement, they discovered four large chests filled with thousands of pills. The knight in charge proclaimed that it would be enough to eliminate Roland. In the border town, Roland initially considered disregarding the matter since a mere 50 person group posed no threat to the border town. He reasoned that allowing only the leader to enter for negotiations would suffice. However, considering Petrov's cautious approach, he deemed it better to keep track of the envoy's movements. With this in mind, he summoned Lightning and Maisie, instructing them to fly to the stronghold and assess the situation along the way. After an hour had passed, the two witches completed their reconnaissance and returned to the castle. They discovered that over a thousand people had departed from Changji stronghold, far surpassing the 50-person envoy. However, only six of them seemed riding on horses, while the majority of the remaining infantry lacked proper armor and wielded an assortment of weapons. If Timothy intended to resolve the situation by force, it would be impossible for them to overlook the battle that had erupted between Changji stronghold and the border town. Duke Ryan's coalition of over 200 knights couldn't even reach the outskirts of the town, let alone these militias without proper equipment and horses. Knowing the course and outcome of the battle, and still advancing towards the town, it could only mean that they were confident in breaking through the town's defenses. Roland couldn't help but think of the church's pills. He had previously speculated whether the church, while supporting himself and Garcia, had also extended its support to Timothy. If these people possessed the pills, the situation would be entirely different. It could enhance the running speed of humans to that of horses within a short period of time, while also eliminating the fear of pain. In other words, the line of defense would face the charge of over a thousand painless knights, and if even one person managed to break into their defense, it would result in casualties for the first army. Roland instructed Lightning and Maisie to bring Nightingale with them to keep watch, but requested that they observe from a distance. Just as the three of them were preparing to leave, Roland stopped them and emphasized the importance of protecting themselves. After the witches departed, he felt a slight unease, realizing a significant mistake he had made in his work. His control over the intelligence regarding Changji stronghold was too weak. If it weren't for Petrov's dispatching messengers, Roland might have found himself in a situation where the enemy was at his doorstep before he even noticed. Once engaged in hand-to-hand -hand warfare, it would be devastating for the first army. I'm still too young, too naive, Roland thought. He reflected that after the war he need to work on his intel, as well as he should also place his own personnel around Petrov. Anna interjected, informing Roland that it wasn't the time to lament. The army of a thousand people would take at least three days to arrive, and the border town still needed Roland's command. She comforted Roland telling him no matter what happens, they will always be on his side. 
At the outskirts of the town, Roland received accurate information that the majority of the enemy did not possess the God Punishment Stone, he stood atop a hill, observing hundreds of people digging several large pits on the ground. Curious, Lightning asked what these pits were for. Roland replied that they were constructing bunkers, brick walls would be built around these holes, leaving a gap for the musketeers to fire from within. Behind them, a defensive line would be formed, consisting of cannons. The artillery units had increased from 4 to 20 groups, with each group equipped with a 12-pound field cannon. The latest field cannons had an effective range of over a kilometer. Roland quickly formulated a preliminary battle plan in his mind. With a smile, he said to the witches, if you want to eat something, go to the cafeteria and tell the chef. Maisie and Lightning happily dashed toward the cafeteria. Nightingale held Anna's hand and informed her that when the enemy attacked, she hoped Anna would take over the duty of guarding his highness and protecting him. Nightingale had to carry out a special mission. Anna glanced at Nightingale for a moment and nodded. Shortly after the two of them then made their way towards the cafeteria. Three days quickly passed and the defense line was nearly complete. The enemy force of a thousand men advanced toward the border town. Two leading knights looked disdainfully at the militia behind them. These militia members had not received specialized training and relied solely on pills provided by the church to be of any use. One of the knights sighed, wondering why they had trained in martial arts from a young age when now, even unarmed farmers could join the battlefield by taking a pill. The knight's words furrowed Raymond's brow, but it wasn't the time to dwell on such matters. In the forest through which the enemy passed, Nightingale's figure emerged. The scout in the vanguard reported that they had discovered the town's military forces up ahead. Raymond took a look through his telescope. According to the information gathered from the wolf and elk families, they primarily relied on a long-range weapon to counter the knight's charges. This weapon could launch an attack before the knights reached their top speed, accompanied by flashes and deafening sounds. It resembled a large crossbow but shot projectiles much faster than arrows. The other knight quickly grasped the key point that although these weapons had tremendous power, they couldn't fire continuously. Raymond nodded. He knew that these 1,500 peasants who had taken the pills could run as fast as horses, and by relying on a swarm tactic, they could swiftly break through the defense line and capture the border town in one fell swoop. Just as Raymond was preparing to give the order to adjust the formation, the corner of his eye caught a glimpse of a white figure. He froze, tilting his head as if he heard, are you sure? He looked at the knight beside him, then glanced around, feeling that he might be hallucinating. He raised his long sword, preparing to order the troops to form a sudden formation, but then, among the militia, Echo appeared, mimicking Raymond's voice, shouting, swallow the pills and charge. In an instant, 1,500 people swallowed the pills without hesitation. Raymond angrily stared at the other knight, thinking he was behind this trickery. Suddenly, Nightingale emerged from behind him, holding a silver revolver in her hand. She said, it's high noon. Raymond felt as if his head had been struck by an iron hammer, and the world spun as darkness engulfed him. The other knight stared blankly at Raymond, who had fallen from his horse. The back of his head had completely exploded, revealing a mixture of red and white gush. Then he heard his own voice ringing out. It shouted, charge, everyone. No, he hadn't spoken at all. He covered his mouth and looked behind him. The militia members were eagerly swallowing the pills and charging forward, callously trampling over Raymond's lifeless body as if a human wall was surging toward him. It was the witch, he realized. The witch had imitated his voice. He commanded everyone to stop, but his voice was like a tiny splash in the surging crowd. The rampaged militia had lost all rationality, and some of them were even charging toward him. The situation had completely spiraled out of control. No matter how loudly he shouted, his voice was drowned out by the fervent roars of the crowd. He swung his weapon at the nearest militia member. He surveyed his surroundings, determined to find the witch responsible for this chaos. The battle had commenced, and twenty cannons erupted in unison. Even when struck by bullets, the medicated militia soldiers, their limbs shattered by exploding shells, continued their charge. 
They swiftly advanced towards the forefront bunkers, with Brian peering through a firing window, observing the encroaching enemy. Gunfire resonated from the leading bunkers as the enemy drew nearer. Prior to the battle, the First Army had been informed that the adversaries were deranged individuals who had ingested church-induced pills. Therefore, the sight of the enemy relentlessly charging through the hail of bullets did not daunt the soldiers, instead, it ignited their fighting spirit, as the First Army had grown accustomed to confronting such monstrous creatures. The enemy soon closed in within 150 meters. Brian took a deep breath and exclaimed, Open fire! The soldiers had eagerly awaited this command, and they wasted no time in pulling their triggers at the carefully aimed targets. In an instant, the bunker was filled with the symphony of gunfire. The first adversaries to cross the firing line were struck by the crisscrossing bullets from both sides, their blood spilling from their waists as they staggered a couple of steps before collapsing to the ground. Brian noticed several individuals attempting to scale the top of the frontline bunker, intending to launch a surprise attack on the soldiers inside. However, they were thwarted by the enclosed bunker that blocked their entry. Without hesitation, Brian redirected his aim and systematically dispatched each exposed assailant. Suddenly, he shouted, take cover, as the enemies behind them hurled dozens of spears. However, the bunker intercepted every projectile. One of the fresh recruits chuckled, assuming there was no danger, and stood up. Yet, a spear, perfectly aimed, pierced through the firing window and impaled his chest. Emitting a muffled groan, he collapsed to the ground. Brian quickly began examining his injuries. The wounded soldier's consciousness remained relatively clear as he trembled, anxiously asking if he was going to die. The short spear had slanted into his lower chest, slightly missing his lungs, as his breathing appeared relatively unobstructed. Brian recalled Roland's advice not to remove the spear in such situations, but rather wait for Nanawa to treat it after the battle. Placing his hand on the soldier's forehead, Brian asked if he knew about Nanawa's abilities. The soldier managed a weak smile and expressed his gratitude for finally having the chance to meet Miss Nanawa. Brian firmly clasped his hand, urging him to hold on. After finishing his words, Brian returned to the firing window, while Roland stood on the elevated platform, providing a clear view of the enemy surging towards the town like a tidal wave. With each row of bunkers they crossed, their speed noticeably decreased. By the time they reached the third row of bunkers, the flanks of the enemy were fully exposed to the crossfire of the musketeers. Soon, the enemy breached the 300 meters range, entering the deadly zone covered by the artillery positions, a zone where shotgun pellets reigned supreme. Vayner commanded the cannons to fire, adjusting their angles to flatten the trajectory. Flames and thick smoke erupted from the cannons, and the devastating impact of the shotgun pellets on unarmored targets was evident, with each ion pellet capable of piercing through two to three individuals. While the pills provided some resistance to pain, they couldn't suppress the innate fear. Witnessing their comrades being turned into sieves, even the overwhelming excitement and thirst for bloodlust couldn't suppress the instinctual fear of their own lives. As half of their forces lay strewn across the assault path, the enemy began to show signs of retreat. Fear spread like a plague, infecting the militia, who dropped their weapons and fled toward the rear. The leading cavalrymen ordered them to come back, but soon enough, a high-velocity artillery shell landed on his head. Roland, observing from the walls, saw the deserters and knew they were never truly a resolute unit. Without the pills, they were just a group of untrained civilians lacking practical combat experience. He hammered the wall in frustration, gritting his teeth. Damning Timothy for utilizing the civilian. The wounded on the defensive line immediately received medical treatment. Nanawa had been stationed at the rear of the defense line, ready to provide aid, especially when the enemy turned to retreat. Disregarding the thunderous sound of cannons, she rushed towards the artillery positions with this campaign, tending to the injured struck by the short spears. It was hard to imagine that half a year ago, she would faint at the sight of blood. Throughout the entire battle, only five individuals were wounded, all from spear throwers, and miraculously, all five survived. Amidst cheers, many soldiers saluted her, watching her depart the battlefield. Levin's blazing anger gradually cooled, replaced by a growing sense of fear. 
his few remaining cavalrymen pursued Nightingale, and he ordered them to consume the pills and find her. Suddenly, two massive vines descended from above, ensnaring the two cavalrymen. At that moment, the sound of footsteps trampling through the undergrowth echoed behind him. Expressionless, a woman in white approached, standing atop a horse. A frigid weapon pressed against his forehead. From this angle, Levon caught a glimpse of the face hidden beneath the hood. A demon? No, was this the witch? She is remarkably beautiful. Before the gunshot rang out, this was his final thought. The sun had yet to set, but the war had already come to an end. In fact, this battle was much easier than dealing with the Duke's coalition. No, it wasn't a battle, it was a massacre. Considering the effects of the pills, Roland didn't immediately order the First Army to pursue the enemy. Instead, he dispatched Lightning and Macy to scout. Without the pills, the addicted militia members deteriorated rapidly, and they were quickly caught up by the pursuing forces. The pursuit units swiftly gathered them all and escorted them to the Changji stronghold. Based on the information obtained from interrogating surrendered knights, Nightingale effortlessly dismantled the remaining garrison at the stronghold. The captain was shot on the spot. It took four days to reach the Changdu stronghold. In the castle dungeon, Roland's subordinates found Petrov, who appeared somewhat weary, however, considering his Count Noble status, he hadn't suffered any inhumane treatment. After nearly three months, the prince met with this representative once again. To prevent a recurrence of the stronghold falling, Roland immediately devised new plans, forming an army, constructing roads, and promoting education. He detailed everything on paper and demanded that Petrov put them into action immediately. Petrov assured him that he wouldn't disappoint Roland again. Next, he asked about how to handle the prisoners. Roland pondered for a moment, sighed, and said to keep them alive. They wouldn't survive for much longer anyway. The church's secret pills, which was also Timothy's objective, could temporarily unleash extraordinary power in ordinary people. However, once the drug's effects wore off, the users would gradually weaken and die. Boarding the little township, the prince embarked on his journey back. He stood at the bow of the ship, appearing troubled. Nightingale materialized beside him and asked, Is it because of those civilians? Roland sighed, gripping the wooden railing tightly. He knew they were all forced by Timothy. If they hadn't taken the church's pills and been manipulated, they wouldn't have acted as pawns for the enemy, dying in this unfamiliar land. Nightingale reached out and held his arm, comforting him. She said, it's not your fault. Roland didn't hesitate to respond, knowing that it wasn't his fault. If Roland hadn't stopped them, the small town would have become a sacrifice to Timothy's lust for power. Everyone would have been killed, soldiers, residents, witches. Of course, the church, the creator of the pills, was also one of the main culprits. Nightingale looked at Roland and said, So, you will destroy the church, put an end to the conflict, and ensure that people no longer have to kill each other for senseless reasons. Under your rule, regardless of their identity or status, whether they are ordinary people or witches, they can all live happily. Is that correct? Roland looked into her sparkling eyes and nodded gently, Yes, I promise. The ocean was like a vast expanse of azure land, only smoother. If Maisie were here, she would have chattered away, reporting how far they were from the islands. But now, all she could hear were the rhythmic sounds of the waves lapping against the ship's hull. Although it grew tedious after a while, for the crew, it was a fortunate rhythm, signifying good weather for sailing. An elderly man with speckled white hair approached her. It was surprising that they had truly settled on Slumbering Isle, despite its large land area, however, when the tide rose, most of the land would be submerged, making it unsuitable for habitation. He questioned why they didn't settle in Crescent Bay instead. It was the second largest island and still had plenty of uninhabited land. Ash chuckled. Not everyone is willing to deal with witches, Jack One-Eye was the captain of this ship, just as his name suggested. His face was adorned with an eye patch, concealing his left eye completely. He was one of the few captains who were willing to transport supplies for the witches. 
Ash was well aware that Slumbering Isle would be engulfed by the sea. It was precisely because of this that it remained an uninhabited island. Witches, being adept at manipulating nature, had the power to transform the island into their own sanctuary. She looked up at the sky and remarked, without the suppression of the church, they could create a completely different world, a brand new world. Ash changed the subject and asked the captain how long it had been since he last visited Slumbering Isle. Jack replied, it's been about a month. He scratched the back of his head, recalling the playful antics of the beautiful and young girls on his ship, which had left his crew dumbfounded. Just then, a sailor raised his binoculars and spotted an island ahead. He immediately reported to the captain. Jack, initially skeptical, ascended the crow's nest and raised his own binoculars. To his astonishment, it was indeed slumbering isle, but it had changed. The entire ship's crew could hardly believe their eyes. The towering island rose above the sea level like a small mountain, with sheer and steep cliffs that extended for several yards to the summit. The witches on the island were going about their daily lives when one of them, with green hair, seemed to sense something. The witch beside her asked what was wrong. She tucked her hair behind her ear and said, she's back. A young girl stood at the edge of the dock, ready to greet Ash. She lowered her head and greeted Ash with a curtsy. Ash gently patted the girl's head and chuckled, no need for such formality. Captain Jack's eyes widened in disbelief. He never expected that they could make an entire island rise. Captain Jack muttered, no wonder those church folks treat witches like demons. This is almost godlike. Little Molly interjected, it didn't rise. We built a wall around the island. Though Molly had a petite figure, she was the main force behind the logistics of the entire slumbering isle. She could summon a massive blue slime that could carry several tons of cargo at once. Captain Jack looked disdainfully at the crew behind him and told them that not a single one of them could match the abilities of a young girl. He walked towards the center of the island, where various houses had been constructed. These buildings were unlike the typical wooden or stone houses, they seemed to have emerged from the depths of the earth with their foundations seamlessly integrated into the ground. The island had two docks, one built at sea level and the other suspended in midair. During high tide, the aerial dock aligned perfectly with the sea surface, and during low tide, it returned to the surface. Molly pointed towards the northernmost house and informed Ash that it was Queen Tilly's palace. Ash nodded, bidding farewell to the two before walking briskly toward the north. The creator of this new home was Tilly Wimbledon, the Witch Queen. Unlike royal palaces, this spacious house had no guards or locked doors. Ash walked through the courtyard and entered the grand hall, only to see a familiar figure with brown hair standing before her. She silently approached from behind and covered the brown-haired woman's eyes with her hand. I'm back, Tilly, she said softly. Tilly wore a brown silk glove with a sparkling ruby embedded on the back of the hand. She explained that the magical gemstone altered the way magic operated. Tilly removed the glove and handed it to Ash, instructing her to imagine magic as something tangible and then release it through the stone. Deep in thought, Ash pondered for a while but failed to produce even a spark of electricity. Tilly had previously tested many individuals and found that out of a hundred people, only two or three could quickly comprehend and unleash lightning through the stone. This raised a question in Tilly's mind, what exactly was magic? The abilities of witches varied greatly, but if the same abilities could be replicated using these stones, she was uncertain whether magic was artificial or naturally occurring. It was said that these magic stones were discovered in ancient ruins. There was a ruin rumored to be located in the eastern forest near Sea Peak County. Tilly expressed her desire to visit it personally. However, Ash interrupted, saying that it is one of the most dangerous places in Grey Castle. She had heard that Garcia's black sail fleet had set sail with the purpose of reaching C.P. County, which happened to be Timothy's territory. Ash suspected that Garcia intended to use his fleet to initiate a large-scale war. Tilly's expression grew concerned. If the internal conflict continued, the church would take advantage of the situation in Grey Castle would suffer the same fate as the Kingdom of Yangdong, being swallowed by the church. This statement left Ash momentarily stunned as if she saw the image of Roland. 
Tilly quickly noticed her unusual reaction and asked what was wrong. Ash rubbed her forehead and explained that Tilly's demeanor just now resembled that of Roland Wimbledon, as Roland had uttered the same words. Tilly became intrigued, surprised that Ash had encountered him. Tilly expressed her curiosity and wanted to know what Ash had gained from their encounter. Upon hearing Ash's account, Tilly pondered for a moment before speaking up, this person isn't Roland Wimbledon. He has been replaced. Ash was taken aback by this revelation. Tilly squinted her eyes, knowing that Roland had gathered a significant number of witches around him. She suspected that one of the witches had taken control of him and assumed his appearance. Having grown up alongside Roland, Tilly knew him better than anyone. Roland was a person who willingly embraced debauchery, lacked ambition, had a penchant for women, and was both sleazy and detestable. His lies were always full of loopholes. Ash raised an eyebrow at Tilly's response, surprised by her remark about how Roland was perceived in Tilly's mind. Tilly sighed and admitted that despite everything, she still needed to establish contact with the Witch Alliance in the border town. After all, Roland was her brother, and even though his character was flawed, he wasn't irredeemable at his core. Compared to the other princes and princesses, he was the least harmful. Ash couldn't help but think of Wendy and the witches in the border town. She believed that those witches wouldn't resort to such actions. Furthermore, she had left Maisie there, and by the end of the month, she would bring back more news from border town for Slumbering Isle. Tilly stood up and looked at Ash. Now that Ash had returned, it was time to move on to the next phase of their plan, the cleansing operation. Tilly issued the command, declaring that there should be no trace of the church remaining in the bay. Ultimately, all the islands in the bay would become a haven for the witches. After repelling Timothy's forces, the border town returned to tranquility. Scroll held a mirror in her hands, and it was the first time she saw her own reflection so clearly. Every witch had tried the mercury-coated mirror, which Soroya had simulated from the laboratory. She applied a bright coating directly to the glass using her ability, mimicking the effect of a mercury mirror while eliminating the risk of mercury vapor poisoning. Soroya said it was Prince Roland's idea, as it would make it more convenient for the witches. Ever since he learned about Soroya's evolution, he had been planning to create a microscope that could observe cellular structures. If they could witness the marvelous microscopic world firsthand, it might trigger the evolution of new abilities in the witches or, at the very least, ignite their interest in learning. Taking advantage of the ample afternoon sunlight, Prince Roland gathered all the members of the Witch Alliance in the backyard of the castle, and the first lesson on natural biology officially began. Once all the witches were assembled, Prince Roland placed two dark gray metallic instruments on the table, the microscope he claimed could reveal the microscopic world. After placing a few drops under the microscope, Roland proceeded to teach the witches how to use it. Anna saw movement in the water, not just one but many tiny organisms resembling small insects. The witches exclaimed in surprise as they observed various organisms, each with its unique appearance. Lightning even found a seemingly transparent crab-like creature. Your Highness, are these really all insects? asked Scroll. Roland explained that what they were seeing were probably protists or single-celled algae, and it would be more appropriate to classify them as microorganisms rather than insects. Seeing Scroll's confusion, he continued his explanation, stating that these microorganisms were also independent life forms, although much smaller in size. In addition to the ones they were observing, there were even smaller bacteria and viruses that couldn't be observed with the current magnification of the microscope. These microorganisms were responsible for food spoilage and various diseases. Roland's enthusiasm grew as he continued his explanations. These tiny life forms were everywhere, in vast numbers. Fortunately, most of them were intolerant to high temperatures, which explained why water should be boiled before drinking, fish should be thoroughly cooked before consumption, and bathing water should not be reused. It was all due to these microorganisms' presence and the potential harm they could cause. Nightingale is drinking the water from the well, but the moment she heard there are small bugs in the water, she spat the water out. As the witches continued to discuss their individual discoveries, Lily approached the microscope, recalling Roland's words about these small organisms being the cause of food spoilage. 
she released her magic, enveloping the water droplet under the microscope. Unexpectedly, a remarkable transformation occurred. Some of the insects started to tremble and rapidly changed their appearance. Their previously transparent bodies became covered in purple armor, and they sprouted numerous tendrils. They began assimilating the unaffected organisms around them, but it wasn't mere consumption. Lily could see that they were assimilating at an astonishing speed, using their sharp tendrils as swords to pierce the other microorganisms and transform them into their own likeness. Nightingale suddenly felt a change in the magic behind her. She sensed a subtle vibration of magic. A swirling mass of purple mist started to form, drawing in the surrounding magic like a miniature storm. This disturbance was only visible to Nightingale, and she snapped out of her astonishment, widening her eyes and holding her breath, determined not to miss any details. Unlike Anna and Soroya, who were oblivious to the unfolding events, this was Nightingale's first first-hand experience of magic condensing. The center of the storm was none other than Lily. Completely absorbed in the microscopic world beneath the microscope, Lily was completely unaware of the qualitative change in her magic within her body. Eventually, the magic gathered inward, gradually coming to a halt. It formed into a compact mass, about the size of a fist, with a round shape and eight pairs of undulating tendrils, four facing downwards and four facing upwards. At first glance, it resembled an insect. Roland was taken by surprise when he witnessed the remarkable effects of the first natural biology class, with Lily being the third witch to undergo evolution. Seeing the microorganisms arranged so neatly under the microscope startled him. They exhibited astonishing coordination and uniformity as if they were saluting Lily. Lily became the third witch to experience an ability evolution. The next step was conducting specific experiments, including studying the effects, duration, and influence of God Punishment Stone on her ability. Perhaps Lily's ability would pave the way for medical advancements in Border Town. The testing lasted for three days. Despite her usual inclination to argue, Lily diligently followed Roland's instructions. Roland instructed Lily to separate the summoned purple insects into the parent organism and the replicated organisms. Whenever Lily released magic, the initial mutated microorganism would be the parent organism. As long as the mother organism had a supply of magic, it could continue to exist. However, it would self-disperse if the distance exceeded 5 meters. Moreover, it would instantly dissipate within the range of the God Punishment Stone. On the other hand, the replicated organisms were not restricted by the God Punishment Stone, appearing as a truly new form of life. They could not reproduce through division and would only live for one day, also being susceptible to high temperatures. Roland also mentioned that assimilating deadly bacteria and viruses could serve as a rapid anti-inflammatory and sterilization method. After coming out of the bath, Lily explained to Rem that it was possible to evolve new abilities without understanding the theory of tiny balls, cells, bacteria, and fungi. By deeply understanding one's own ability, magic could undergo a qualitative transformation. Lily yawned and confessed that she didn't understand the concepts of cells, bacteria, and fungi, but she suggested that Rem could ask Anna to teach her. However, with Anna being busy every day, Rem didn't know when to approach her. Lily jokingly proposed that Rem could ask Anna during their bath time together. In the evening, May walked to the shade in the center of the market area and sat for a while. A tall man approached her with quick strides. It was Carter, the chief knight of the border town. Ever since she had turned down his previous invitation, he had not given up but persistently visited her. May followed Carter and saw a shelf with five or six pink cubes, each about the size of a palm. This was His Highness's recent invention. Now, everyone in the castle uses it for bathing. After washing, one experiences an entirely different and refreshing sensation, leaving a lingering aroma of roses on the skin because perfume was added to it. May picked up a piece and brought it to her nose, inhaling the unmistakable scent of roses. Subconsciously, she glanced at the price. In the capital city, a bottle of perfume the size of a thumb costs 5 gold royals, while this sizable bar of soap is priced at just 25 silver coins. Once again, it was His Royal Highness. 
since arriving in the border town, May had heard the name Roland Wimbledon mentioned more than any other. Whether it was Eileen or Carter, whenever they spoke of the town's transformation, his name would inevitably come up. It seemed that His Highness knew everything. Carter was exceptionally thrifty and frugal. He purchased several bars of soap and gifted them to May. As May looked into his earnest eyes, she felt a strange sensation in her heart, as if something had gently scorched it. For a considerable amount of time, she pursed her lips and remained silent, silently watching as Carter neatly wrapped the soap. The Stronghold Theater wanted May to return and perform, considering that the Border Towns Theater was supported by third-rate actors and attended by the common folk. As the star of the Western Frontier, the bustling city should have been the most suitable stage for her. However, she really wanted to learn more about the border town. At this moment, Carter handed her a beautifully packaged box. It contained a mirror. Carter said, you look as beautiful tonight as you did on that day on the stage. Returning to her home in the border town, the window displayed a dusky yellow hue. The setting sun's radiant glow seeped through the window, casting a tinge of orange-red on the objects in the room. May arranged the novelty items she had purchased from the market on the table. Besides the four bars of soap, there was a bottle of wine. Removing the cork from the bottle, May poured herself a glass. As she raised the glass, a trace of the wine's fragrance wafted into her nose, sweet and rich. May finished the remaining wine in her glass and her vision gradually became blurred. She stumbled towards the desk, opened a piece of paper, and began composing a reply. She wrote a letter to the Stronghold Theater, expressing her gratitude but declining their request. May was not ready to return to the Stronghold Theater at the moment. In her mind, only the image of Carter's smile remained. Hello, Miss May. May I invite you for a drink? Roland sat behind his desk, eagerly observing the knight who had come to report on the recent situation of the First Army. Compared to a few months ago, when Carter had a meticulous demeanor, there were now different emotions on his icy face. The sense of calmness had diminished, replaced by a hint of anticipation and impatience. Berev and Roland looked at Carter, and Berev jokingly asked, Your Highness, do you know this person? Is he a newly recruited knight? Roland smiled and replied, I'm not sure. Let me check the list. Roland had heard some rumors about Carter becoming closer to May lately. However, Roland didn't mind such matters. He hoped that Carter could find his significant other. According to the report from the night, the First Army had currently equipped around 200 rifles, and there was also progress in forming the Second Army. Proper management of firearms was crucial during live shooting exercises, what was taken out had to be accounted for. The same applied to gunpowder, with on-site distribution during training, and veteran soldiers from the First Army were assigned to supervise. After the work report concluded, Carter hesitated for a moment, scratched his head, and asked if it was true that thumb-sized perfumes from the capital city could be sold for five gold royals. If that were the case, Cater pondered whether producing perfumes from sugarcane could bring substantial income to the town. The mention of money widened Roland's eyes, and Berev mentioned that the perfumes were highly confidential products from the capital city. Only a thousand bottles were produced each year, and only a small portion of them are put into the market. Berev believed that Carter's idea was feasible. There are various methods for making perfume, but the simplest one involves crushing flower petals or herbs with unique scents and soaking them in alcohol. This allows the alcohol to dissolve the aromatic oils within the plants. Afterward, the residue is filtered out, and water is added to dilute the mixture for use. Alcohol can be obtained through the fermentation of sugarcane juice. As for the raw materials for the aromatic oils, roses can be used as they are cost-effective and have a high selling potential. Additionally, exporting and selling by geo and white sugar to the capital city and then offering them at a lower price to the townspeople can improve their livelihoods. Roland held a lavish banquet in the castle to welcome the arrival of the merchants. It was also the first time that by geo appeared before the guests. Hogarth took a sip and felt the fiery taste of the by geo, far surpassing the blandness of beer and wine. Roland had simply produced some as an experiment. 
During an era when brewing was still the mainstream, distilled liquor clearly stood out as a highly promising product. Spirits like future hard liquor, rum, whiskey, and vodka, all high in alcohol content, emerged from the process of distillation. Along with these distilled spirits, a range of cocktail cultures also developed. However, for the border town, it was still too early to delve into this industry. Margaret showed great interest in the perfume business. In response to the instructions she had given in the previous letter, she had already dispatched people to gather a wealth of information. After the church took control of the internal winter kingdom, not much happened. However, the resistance in the Wolfhart kingdom was much stronger. The church's forces were concentrated at the Broken Tooth Fortress, and they hadn't made any progress for two months. King from the Dawnlight Kingdom sent a messenger to Greycastle, believing that the church's intention was to take over all the kingdoms. He hoped that the two nations could form an alliance, expel the church's influence, and jointly confront the holy city. Margaret said, Timothy rejected the proposal. Hogarth waved his hand and said, Timothy led the army to the eastern frontier. It is said that a massive fleet has already landed in the Seabreeze County and is plundering extensively in the eastern frontier. The eastern frontier has already seen a large influx of refugees. According to their intel, these plunderers not only rob people of their wealth but also show no mercy towards human lives. They burn down whatever they cannot take away. Margaret asked if Roland had any interest in these people. Roland realized that this was a great opportunity to expand the population. As long as people were willing to settle in the border town, they would be provided with food, housing, and even paid for their work. He inquired about the total number of people. Another merchant replied that most of the strong and healthy man had been taken in by nobles and merchants. The remaining approximately 10,000 people had gathered outside the capital city, with a higher proportion of young children and women among them. Roland made preparations to send Tacit to scout and find a route, while Margaret would provide ships. The two reached an agreement. For days later, the merchant fleet set sail, raising their sails and leaving the dock. Tassa, Margaret, and a hundred soldiers from the First Army embarked on the journey to the capital city. On the ship, the two of them had a conversation. Tassa was born in the capital city and used to work as a palace guard. Margaret asked how it felt to return to his old home. Tassa chuckled bitterly, saying that if it weren't for His Highness's arrangement, he would prefer to stay in the border town. While the capital city was prosperous, it also felt oppressive. Margaret leaned closer and asked Tassa how he saw Prince Roland. Margaret believed that Roland was an extraordinary person. Despite his poor reputation in the capital city, he was entirely different in the border town. If his inventions were the only reason, then why were these trained soldiers so remarkable? As they looked at the soldiers nearby, some were polishing their weapons, and others were patrolling. Compared to the hired guards of her merchant convoy, who would rush to the cabins for entertainment and sleep, it was a stark contrast. Tassa shrugged helplessly. It's not that he wanted to conceal anything, but he genuinely didn't know. Since the fourth prince arrived in the border town, he had become completely different from before. Perhaps Prince Roland had been disguising himself all along. Soon, the merchant ship caught sight of the city walls of the capital. As the city walls came into clear view for Tassa, so did the sight of the refugees. A large number of civilians had gathered outside the outskirts of the capital city, setting up makeshift shelters along the city walls. White smoke rose from the fire pits in front of the shelters, seemingly boiling wheat porridge. However, the relief food in the capital city wouldn't last indefinitely. Once the nobles selected suitable laborers, they would send soldiers to drive these people away. After arriving at the dock, Tassa instructed the soldiers of the First Army to wait for further instructions in the outskirts, avoiding the patrols of the capital city as much as possible. Meanwhile, he accompanied the merchant convoy into the city. Passing through the city gates, he noticed that the guards were conducting much stricter inspections, evidently trying to prevent the eastern refugees from infiltrating the city. As they entered the city, the first thing that caught Tassa's eye was a row of towering gallows with two women bound and hanging from them. 
Timothy was aggressively hunting witches in the city. These women were unfortunate ones who had been captured. During the six months in the border town, Tassa had come to realize that witches were not as unforgivable as the church propaganda depicted them. Besides their peculiar and rare abilities, they were no different from ordinary people. Seeing the action of Timothy and the people from the capital made him sick to his stomach. The next day, Maisie also arrived, marking her temporary departure from the border town. As per the agreement made with Ash, she would travel to the slumbering isle and deliver news regarding the border town. Roland took special care to write a lengthy letter for Maisie, expressing not only their spirit of mutual assistance and cooperation but also requesting that Tilly could send some auxiliary witches to assist him. The farewell took place in the castle's backyard, where all the witches had gathered. Each person presented Maisie with a small gift, which delighted her. Before leaving, Lightning asked what Maisie would do if Tilly refused to let her come back. Maisie thought for a moment and then replied that she would secretly fly back. In Roland's heart, he gave Lightning a thumbs up, realizing that within a month, Maisie had been completely won over. Maisie unfurled her majestic wings, clutching her package with her claws. After circling twice, she gradually disappeared into the southeast. Lily carefully observed Maisie in the sky and remarked that she seemed to have gained weight. The outer city area of the capital remained largely unchanged, and after crossing two streets, the caravan proceeded toward the market district. Tassa and Margaret waved goodbye, and Tassa ventured alone into a narrow alley. On the table lay a token, a skeletal finger, which may sound frightening, but it was just one among many rats in the dark alleys of the capital. A burly man introduced their group, including one recent addition who had lost everything due to gambling, his money, his wife, and even his house. Penniless, he had no choice but to join the ranks of the dark streets. Tassa had come to discuss business and wasted no time. He directly addressed the increasing number of refugees and the decreasing daily rations for relief. If this continued, a revolt would erupt in the capital. The burly man asked what they needed to do, and Tassa replied that they had to spread a message, a lord in the western border town was willing to accept refugees. In three days, a fleet would arrive at the dock. Tassa didn't provide any further information but was willing to offer double the original reward. One of the members suggested that he will go along with a young girl from their group since Timothy had ordered the hunting of witches within the city, and any woman venturing outside had to be cautious, as many had been wrongfully killed. Tassa sighed, recalling the gallows he had seen in front of the city gates. He closed his eyes and hoped Prince Roland will soon become the king of Grey Castle. In the vicinity of the capital, inside a tent, there were two sisters who were thrilled to be heading towards the western town. They believed that once they reached their destination, everything would improve. Suddenly, the younger sister began coughing, and at first, the older sister assumed it was just because she had eaten too quickly. The younger sister looked at her hand, where dark spots had appeared in her palm. A strange illness had suddenly emerged in the capital city. The first victims were found lying by the roadside, their bodies covered in dark patches, teeth falling out, skin cracking, and blood oozing out, as terrifying as when witches were consumed by demonic forces. However, the deceased were not women, they were male commoners residing in the northern district of the city. Several more bodies with the same symptoms were discovered, and those who had come into contact with the bodies began developing dark spots on their own bodies. No herbs could cure the illness, and even during bloodletting treatments, the blood turned blackish-red as if mixed with a large amount of ink. Fear quickly spread among the crowd, and the number of people seeking solace in the church and praying increased, but all efforts were in vain. More and more people exhibited dark spots on their bodies, and even the refugees outside the city began showing the same symptoms. The high priest of the church stepped forward, declaring that everything was caused by witches, who were unleashing the devil's power to infect innocent people. Currently, no treatment methods could withstand the demonic force, and those affected would perish in extreme agony. However, the church would not stand idly by. They claimed to have developed a holy elixir capable of restraining the demonic force. The high priest gave the infected individuals a glimmer of hope, and they gathered every day outside the church, awaiting the distribution of the holy elixir. 
Although Tassa harbored doubts about the church's claims, he temporarily halted the transportation of refugees just to be on the safe side. After leaving the tavern, he found a shop marked with the emblem of the Margaret caravan and presented his token. It didn't take long for him to meet the female merchant again in the back room of the shop. Tassa took out a neatly folded letter from his pocket. Please ensure that Margaret delivers this letter to His Highness as soon as possible. Lucia felt nauseous after several days of sailing. Over the past month, it seemed like she had been constantly on the run escaping from the eastern city to the capital, and now rushing from the capital towards the western border town. However this was her last glimmer of hope. Her younger sister let out a painful groan and reached out, grabbing her arm. A middle-aged man in the cabin, weakened and struggling for breath, warned her not to get too close. The dark spots had already spread to her sister's neck, and she wouldn't last much longer. Shortly after leaving the capital, people on the ship began contracting the horrifying illness. It started with a fever throughout the body, followed by the appearance of dark spots on the skin. The symptoms would rapidly worsen after three or four days, causing the afflicted to fall into a coma and infect those who came into contact with them. Consequently, on the fifth day, the fleet specifically cleared a sailboat to transport the infected individuals. Lucia speculated that the reason they didn't simply throw the sick refugees into the river was that their own people had also been infected. However, Lucia hadn't given up hope. She believed that once they reached the western border town, everything would improve. In her heart, if the rumors were true, the witch association would be her last hope. A soldier on the ship confirmed her thoughts, saying, You're right. When we arrive in the western border town, his highness the prince will provide treatment. His eyes were filled with confidence and respect. News of the epidemic quickly reached the border town, sounding eerily similar to the infamous Black Death. However, the plague bacterium couldn't possibly cause people's blood to change color, let alone make their skin crack open. With these thoughts in mind, Roland gave orders to Carter, commanding him to lead the First Army to set up a quarantine zone outside the docks, forbidding anyone from entering or leaving. Roland gathered all the witches, knowing that this situation was extremely delicate. He had just received Tassa's message and had no time to devise a thorough plan. The key depended on Lily's abilities. Lily began the disinfection process, and the stage was set for her. Roland summoned two carpenters, and with Anna's help, they quickly constructed a rectangular box-shaped room. In the center of the room, there was a partition with a small glass window embedded at the top, allowing a view of the opposite side. Below the partition, there was a flexible curtain drawn by Soraya, symmetrically perforated with two small holes for Lily to extend her hands through. The order at the docks was maintained by over a hundred soldiers from the First Army, who believed that the angelic Nanoa would surely restore them to full health in the face of the terrifying contagious disease. Once the box room was prepared, a soldier who could still walk on his own and only had black spots on his arms was selected. He followed the instructions and entered the room, standing still as Lily extended her hand through the partition to unleash her power. Roland stood by her side, observing the soldier's condition through the window. After a burst of purple light, Lily nodded and retracted her hand. Roland also noticed that the black spots on the soldier's hands were rapidly fading away. Roland asked the soldier, whose eyes were covered, how he felt. The soldier said his strength had returned. Suddenly, the soldier recognized Roland's voice and saluted excitedly. Roland realized that these black spots were not caused by the bubonic plague, but rather by sepsis and severe cyanosis. Nevertheless, Lily's new ability did indeed have a healing effect on unknown diseases, which relieved Roland to some extent. This time, he decided that everyone, regardless of whether they had symptoms or not, should undergo treatment. The soldier bowed multiple times, thanking Miss Nanawa for the treatment. Roland said, actually, it was Miss Lily who saved your life. The soldier touched his head and added, thank you, Miss Lily. After the soldier left, Lily's face turned red, and she glanced at the prince with a tsundere expression, saying, I don't need anyone's gratitude. Roland smiled and couldn't help but reach out to gently rub her head. Surprisingly, she didn't protest, only letting out a muted groan. 
Nightingale entered and reported that there was a magical presence in the bloodshed by those people. This was an unexpected discovery. Anything related to magic was either caused by witches or associated with the church. At least now it could be confirmed that this epidemic was not caused by natural bacteria or viruses. A blood sample was taken an infected individual. He embedded a glass slide smeared with dark blood onto the scope and adjusted the focus. As the scene within the lens gradually became clear, Roland could hardly believe his own eyes. Within the scope, several creatures with tentacles and swollen bellies were swimming slowly in the liquid, occasionally emitting a sticky substance from their tails. However, Lily's ability allowed the duplicates to prioritize attacking these peculiar creatures. After all the first army soldiers had recovered, to prevent any accidents, Roland ordered all the refugees entering the compartment to cover theorize and be led in by the soldiers. Meanwhile, another compartment was set up primarily for Nanawa to treat severely ill patients with gaping wounds. The treatment continued from noon until evening, and when all ten boats with over 500 people had fully recovered, a thunderous cheer erupted from the crowd. Many people fell to their knees, shouting long live your highness, and the waves of sound seemed endless, unable to be subdued. You don't seem very happy, Nightingale blinked at him. It wasn't me who cured the epidemic, it was Lily and Nanawa, the witches, Roland shook his head. They should be the ones receiving the cheers from everyone. Nightingale smiled, seemingly understanding Roland's thoughts, and she patted his shoulder. The day will come, sooner or later, she looked into the distance and added, perhaps the Witch Alliance will have a new member. Rin's condition stabilized. Lucia and Rin were at the forefront of the entire treatment process, which proceeded rapidly. With her eyes covered, Lucia held her sister and walked into the small cabin with the support of the soldiers. Exiting the room and removing her blindfold, she was pleasantly surprised to see Rin's was recovering. Though still in a coma state, her forehead was no longer feverish, the flush on her face faded, and the dark spots vanished without a trace. The events that followed were exactly as rumored. Prince Roland not only lit bonfires by the docks and distributed meat porridge to everyone, but he also informed them that as long as they were willing to work for the town, they could receive wage, food, and a place to live. Only Lucia felt a twinge of anxiety. She thought about her parents' fate, and tears welled up in her eyes. Now that her parents were gone and they couldn't return to their home, their only hope was to find the Witch Alliance. Suddenly, Nightingale appeared from behind, startling her. Lucia turned around and took two steps forward, preparing to escape. But when she saw her appearance, Lucia couldn't help but stand frozen in place. Nightingale introduced herself as a witch and welcomed them to the border town. Soon, Nightingale led Lucia to meet His Royal Highness, showcasing her own abilities. Roland was highly intrigued by Lucia's ability, which allowed her to change an object back to its original form. Lucia approached the table and placed her hand above a glass. Before long, the glass began to shrink and deform, ultimately transforming into three entirely different substances. Roland was astounded by Lucia's incredible ability and wanted to ask if she could manipulate other objects. Just then, Lucia's stomach growled. Nightingale remarked that Lucia hadn't eaten all day and suggested testing her abilities the next day. Welcome to the Witch Alliance. A group of witches of various ages and vibrant appearances raised their glasses in the hall, laughing joyfully. Thank you, Lucia felt her eyes welling up again. She sniffed and held back the urge to shed tears. Each which was exceptionally warm and welcoming. It was the first time Lucia had seen so many of her kind, and her last trace of doubt dissipated. If witches were imprisoned here or forced to serve the Lord, they wouldn't display such carefree and bright smiles. This was indeed the witch's home. After the banquet, Lucia bid the witches good night and returned to their new residence. Prince Roland had allocated the last guest room on the second floor of the castle for herself and Rin. Despite Rin not being a witch, he didn't insist on separating herself from her sister. When heard a sound in the room, Rin opened her eyes. Lucia's heart leaped with joy, and she rushed to the bedside, inquiring about her sister's condition. Rin seemed as though she had just awoken from a long sleep, 
completely free from the suffering caused by the epidemic. Her gaze was somewhat unfocused, but she mumbled, I feel so hungry. Lucia took out the dried fish Nightingale had given her and fed it to her sister, telling her they had arrived at the border town. Gently stroking Rin's head, Lucia assured her that everyone welcomed them and that the lord of this place was truly kind. Rin looked at her sister, munching on the dried fish, and asked, But sister, aren't all nobles bad? Lucia coughed twice and said, Even among the nobles, there are a few good people. Rin picked up the last piece of fish from the bag and asked if her sister if the prince needed her sister to work, like the maids at home, sweeping and cooking, and even serving in bed. Lucia pinched Rin's face asking who told her all this. Rin mumbled and replied that their mother had said that, which was why their father was never allowed to recruit pretty maids. At the mention of their family, Lucia's expression dimmed. She didn't blame Rin anymore but embraced her sister and let out a gentle sigh. Ever since their family discovered Lucia's witch abilities, her parents had done everything possible to protect her from falling into the hands of the church. However, whenever Lucia thought about her own abilities, she couldn't help but feel worried. Reverting objects to their original state proved to be utterly useless. Initially, Lucia had been curious about her abilities, but she quickly realized how difficult it was to control them. She would only end up completely destroying the painstakingly crafted creations of others. But now, what worried Lucia, even more, was the fear that if the prince deemed her useless, he would kick her out of the castle. With an anxious heart, she blew out the candle and held her sister, who had finished gnawing on the dried fish. She closed her eyes slowly, awaiting the arrival of a new day. Roland had filled his office floor with various testing objects early in the morning. There were solid and liquid substances, minerals and metal ingots, inorganic and organic materials, everything you could think of. He asked Lucia to test each one individually. Nightingale sat on the table, picking up a small dumpling from the plate and throwing it into her mouth while watching Roland. He said Lucia's ability was incredibly useful, both in decomposition and restoration, as it could bring significant progress to the fields of metallurgy and manufacturing. Combined with Anna's ability, it could increase the strength of machinery several times over. Nightingale ate her dumpling, looked at Lucia, and remarked that Lucia herself didn't seem to think so. Next, they tested grapes and steak. Roland watched eagerly as Lucia transformed each test item into a pile of different substances. Iron ingots and iron ores turned into silver-white particles, with some colored powder visible on the side. Grapes and steak remained unchanged, but the small dumplings turned into water, meat scraps, and flour. However, halfway through the transformation, Lucia suddenly stopped as her mana was depleted. Shortly after, Roland extended another invitation to Lucia, urging her to stay in the border town. He promised to provide her with meals, accommodations, and a salary. Each evening, after dinner, there would be lessons taught by Scroll specifically for the witches, and Lucia could bring her sister along as well. Lucia was taken aback for a moment, but then she lifted her head and, upon confirming that Roland was not joking, she happily bowed in gratitude. After three days, when the second fleet carrying refugees from the capital city arrived at the town, the same epidemic broke out on the ship, but this time it was even more severe, infecting nearly half of the passengers. Meanwhile, Roland received a letter sent from the capital city, bearing the seal of the Marguerite Trading Company. As he finished reading the contents of the letter, his brows furrowed. The malignant epidemic was spreading rapidly in the capital city, and the church proclaimed it as a witch's conspiracy while declaring that they possessed a holy remedy to combat the epidemic. A large number of infected individuals also appeared outside the city walls, and for safety reasons, Tassa chose to temporarily halt the transportation of refugees. After careful consideration, Roland decided to send a team to escort Lily to the capital city. Otherwise, the majority of the capital's citizens and the eastern refugees would perish in this artificially created disaster, while those who survived would become devout followers of the church. This was the first military expedition for the border town, far from their usual operations in the western region. Unlike the two previous defensive battles, Roland quickly formulated a comprehensive rescue plan. He gathered all the corps members and outlined two main tasks, first, 
to protect the witches who could cure the refugees and bring them back to border town, and second, to prevent the further spread of the malignant epidemic. The primary method of treatment relied on Lily, who could purify the collected river water and feed it to the patients. Roland also hinted to his team that he believed this outbreak might have been caused by the church. Upon the outbreak of the epidemic, the church immediately claimed to possess the antidote but deliberately withheld it from the refugees, wanting to play the role of savior. It was necessary to thwart the church's conspiracy. Tassa had a meeting with Margaret, and His Highness needed to transport all the refugees back to the western region within a very short time frame. It required a large number of ships and Margaret's assistance, but it had to be done within three days. Margaret hesitated for a moment, then shook her head repeatedly, saying it was impossible. Transporting all the refugees within three days would require the preparation of nearly a hundred sailboats, even if the trading company suspended other shipping operations to meet this demand. However, Margaret would suffer losses of thousands of golden dragons, and the loss of customers could not be quantified. As a businesswoman, Margaret couldn't accept that. Tassa then presented Margaret with a letter from His Highness, assuring her that he considered her a friend and would not let his friends suffer any losses. Transporting the refugees within three days was also an urgent matter, as any delay would risk the church's discovery. Finally, Tassa mentioned that lightning would also be involved in this operation. Upon hearing this, Margaret's attitude changed, and she directly asked when it would happen. Tassa was puzzled by her response, wondering if the female merchant had a special connection with the lively and adorable blonde girl. Margaret stood up and said she would arrange everything as soon as possible. The church's soldiers climbed the walls and shot crossbow arrows at the witches, but their efforts were futile against Shabby's earth wall and Molly's giant slime. The arrows either fell uselessly or were devoured by the slime. Only when the church's arrows were embedded with stones of God punishment did they pose a threat. After a couple of rounds of shooting, more than twenty witches had advanced to the edge of the wall. Ash leaped onto the wall, swiftly eliminating any daring soldiers who dared to expose themselves. Macy covered Ash as Ash systematically slayed them one by one. The witches surged forward, unleashing their abilities and launching attacks against the soldiers. After the intense battle, the witches managed to clear the last remaining church, with the bodies of the enemy's followers scattered inside. Only the captain remained, and Ash crushed the pills on the ground, reminding him of the pain he inflicted upon the innocent. She then beheaded him with her giant sword. With victory achieved, the witches rejoiced and cheered. Ash hurried back to Tilly's residence to deliver the news of their triumph. When asked about Macy, Tilly shook her head and said she have flew back to the border town as soon as she have finished delivering the victory news. Her curiosity about border town grew stronger, wondering what charm it held that captivated Macy so much. Ash hesitated for a moment before saying, perhaps I shouldn't have left her there. Tilly shook her head, indicating that Maisie staying in border town allowed them to maintain contact. Tilly received a letter from Roland, and she asked Ash to guess her response. Ash chuckled and said it must be a rejection, as it seemed unlikely for the witches to be sent to him. However, Tilly shook her head and revealed that she had agreed to Roland's request. She also provided him with an introduction to the witches' abilities on Slumbering Isle. As long as Roland could ensure the safety of the witches, she would consider sending some of them to Border Town. Tilly herself was also interested in visiting Border Town, but Ashes expressed concerns for her safety. Tilly reassured her that Roland could allow the witches to learn and evolve their abilities, and Sylvie had the ability to see through any disguises, whether they were makeup or magical illusions. This way, they could uncover the truth about the fourth prince. Before that, they needed to visit an ancient relic on the Isle of Shadows. And now, the greatest explorer was currently on Slumbering Isle, as he was the first to discover this relic. He would assist Tilly in reaching this ancient site. Entering the capital city had become quite troublesome in recent times due to the presence of refugees outside the city walls. All the major gates of the capital were sealed shut. As Brian and Echo ventured into the refugee zone, they couldn't help but furl their brows. The place was filled with ailing souls on the verge of collapse, their bodies oozing blackened blood and pus from festering wounds. 
The church claimed to distribute medicine, prompting crowds of infected individuals to surge towards the city gates, yet what awaited them was bows and crossbows from the guards atop the city gates. Roland devised a plan for Echo to employ her unique abilities, projecting her voice to specific areas or individuals. In this manner, the treatment was administered discreetly, avoiding any major commotion. Brian witnessed Echo parting her lips, but no sound escaped. However, those among the refugees turned their heads in response. In their mind, they heard a voice akin to that of an angel, guiding them toward the docks where they would receive a free cure. Soon, a group of people stumbled and rushed towards them, as if they had finally grasped a glimmer of hope. Brian began guiding the refugees, while other soldiers stepped forward to help lift the immobile patients lying on the ground. The procession swiftly grew to several hundred individuals, all making their way toward the canal docks. Many others noticed this sight and followed suit. Upon their return to the docks, soldiers had arranged bags filled with purified water on a long table. Standing beside the table, he informed the refugees that, by drinking these canteens, they would be cured. Simultaneously, he warned them that the church's words were all lies, and their so-called sacred medicine was merely a ploy to extract more money from the people, forcing them to grovel in gratitude for saving their lives. On the other hand, His Highness Roland not only brought the medicines but also demanded no payment. Yes, not even a single copper coin. This proclamation stirred unrest among the crowd. Although some were still skeptical. They had nothing to lose. The first person to consume the purified water soon experienced changes in their body. In disbelief, they tore open their clothes and watched as the black spots rapidly faded away. This medicine truly works. I'm healed, I'm healed, they exclaimed. As more people recovered, the crowd's reactions grew increasingly fervent. If it weren't for the soldiers maintaining order, it was likely that the long table holding the canteen of water would have been swarmed and toppled by the desperate refugees. The soldier in charge continued to speak loudly, proclaiming that His Highness Roland required a substantial workforce to the border town in the western frontier. Anyone willing to venture to the western lands and serve him would receive food, shelter, and wages. Of course, those who were not interested, worry not, as they would depart in three days. All the food for these three days would be provided by the merchant caravan for free. Brian was delighted to witness that not a single person from this group of several hundred chose to stay in the capital city. Instead, they all boarded the sailboats bound for the western frontier. As soon as a boat was filled to capacity, it set sail, followed by the empty vessels that gradually caught up. Under the command of Margaret, there was no pause in the operation, the treatments proceeded in an orderly manner, batch after batch of refugees being attended to. Suddenly, Brian noticed the first army stationed in the southern field springing into action. A small squad sprinted swiftly towards the northern bank of the canal, their hands firmly gripping their firearms. It appeared they had discovered individuals secretly attempting to escape by jumping off the ships, likely rats hiding among the refugees. They had already caught several rats, and once these individuals were apprehended, they immediately confessed their origins and purpose. Axe looked expressionless at the captured individuals. However, what surprised him was that the person on the ground appeared to be in good health, unlike someone who had already fallen ill. The first words he uttered were unexpected, he claimed he wasn't an enemy. He claimed to know Tassa, at this time, both Tassa and Brian quickly arrived. Tassa revealed that he was a subordinate of Black Hammer, acting on his orders to spread messages, but they hadn't anticipated him disregarding the risks of infection and infiltrating among the refugees. You deceived Black Hammer, and you deceived the skeleton fingers, Hill suddenly spoke. You're not working for Timothy, you serve His Highness Roland Wimbledon in the Western Lands. Tassa looked at Hill and made a throat-slashing gesture toward Axe. This man knew too much. Hill continued, mentioning that he overheard the soldiers' conversation at the docks and expressed his willingness to serve His Highness. Axe drew his sword, not wanting to bring even the slightest threat to the border town, as Hill loudly stated. I'm not a rat. I am an enemy of Timothy. A small crystal bottle fell out of his pocket. 
Hill went on, explaining that he had paid a hefty sum to acquire it from the black market, hoping it could help trip up Timothy and aid his highness. Tassa looked at the small bottle in his hand. If it were a normal circumstance where he couldn't determine its authenticity, he would have no hesitation in killing Hill. However, fortunately, Nightingale was also present here. Hill began recounting his own story. He wasn't a destitute gambler, and his wife hadn't run away with someone else, those were all fabrications he had made up. He was originally a member of a small acrobatics troupe, and although the troupe wasn't large, they had a close-knit bond. It was within the troupe that he met his wife. They fell in love and got married, quickly saving up their earnings in the capital city to buy a house. However, all of this was disrupted by Timothy's witch hunt operation. His soldiers, like rabid dogs, captured women on the streets, and his wife was one of the unfortunate victims. He believed that paying the ransom would secure her release. The warden accepted the ransom but did not set her free. Unexpectedly, the situation took a sharp turn, and when he was notified to come and collect her from the prison, all he found was a battered corpse. Hill angrily demanded justice, but in the end, the warden, the gang leader, and the guards were only sentenced to ten lashes and fined twenty-five silver. This led Hill to vow revenge against the new king, and he hadn't anticipated that this decision would gain the approval of his entire acrobatics troupe. However, a group of actors without combat skills, wealth, or subordinates seeking revenge was an almost impossible goal. The only thing Hill could think of was to gather information about Timothy and provide it to his enemies, such as Queen Garcia. They all joined different underground organizations on the black market, infiltrating them to gather any clues and intel related to the new king. Hill secretly monitored Tassa and discovered that Tassa wasn't serving Timothy after all. The person Tassa truly served was Roland Wimbledon, the fourth prince of Grey Castle. Tassa looked at Nightingale, and she smiled. Nightingale said, Hill didn't lie, but whether he can be of use to border town is up to Tassa to decide. Hill looked at Nightingale and said, Prince Roland is truly different. He not only strives to treat the refugees but also treats witches equally. Reflecting on his wife, he continued, if Timothy were the same, my wife wouldn't have. Nightingale and Tassa exchanged a subtle smile. Tassa untied Hill and asked him to follow him into the city. In the evening, Tassa returned to the tavern with Hill. Hill acted as if nothing had happened, sitting across from Tassa with a slight restraint, just like on any other normal day. Tassa brought medication to treat the plague. A bottle of medicine from the church would cost 25 gold royal, but Tassa sneered, saying that they didn't need the church's medicine. He presented several canteens and said, a bag of medication would only cost 10 silver. Black Hammer didn't believe him right away and grabbed one to feed it to his ill member, miraculously, the infected member was healed immediately. Black Hammer and his members hesitated, seeming to consider how to extract more profit from it, their eyes fixed on the pouch on the table. Tassa knew that selling the medication through the black market using rats wouldn't attract too much attention, but these individuals would surely not sell the medication at the price he gave them. The task entrusted to Tassa by Prince Roland was to thwart the church's conspiracy as much as possible. The goal was to make everyone understand that the church's medication was not the only cure for the plague, especially for those believers who had paid a high price for the sacred medicine. They would begin to doubt whether the spokesperson of the church was deceiving them. Tassa took out a dagger from his clothes, his tone turning cold. He forcefully stabbed the dagger into the table and threatened. My employer is not a kind-hearted person. If you don't want to end up at the bottom of the ocean, it's better to restrain yourselves a bit. After all, only by staying alive do you have a chance to enjoy your fortune. To prevent others from reselling the medication, Tassa allowed each person to buy only one bag, and they had to use it on the spot. Black Hammer clenched his teeth, looking around at the four individuals in the room, and reluctantly accepted the task given by Tassa. In the grand hall of the cathedral, a high priest looked down upon a kneeling farmer at his feet. The once robust figure of the farmer had now hunched into a frail form. He knelt on the ground, confessing that all his money had been tricked away by rats in his desperation to buy medicine. With his last remaining possession, a single egg, he offered it up in his hands, seeking redemption. 
The high priest accepted the egg with a smile and declared that the gods had forgiven him. The farmer couldn't believe it and continued to bow his head in gratitude. The ritual continued until dusk. Suddenly, a priest leaned in close to the high priest's ear and whispered that the rat had brought news. It seemed that more and more sick people were being taken away from the city outskirts. Following the church's previous instructions, the high priest needed to fully utilize the plague and the antidote to convert as many followers as possible. In a small room located in the basement, the high priest encountered the rat. His appearance truly resembled that of a rat. After introducing himself, the rat explained what he had seen and heard in the past few days. He had witnessed ships on the canal continuously ferrying away the sick, and they seemed to have a method to cure the plague. Among this group of people, there was even a witch. The rat had spotted a flying witch in the sky. The high priest inquired about their numbers, to which the rat responded that they had no armor, no horses, and their weapons consisted of long wooden weapons there were approximately a hundred of them, and it seemed they were recruited by the lord of the border town. In response to the rat's information, the high priest tossed a crystal vial as a reward for the rat's efforts. Upon catching the vial, the rat's hands trembled uncontrollably. Suddenly, his body jerked, and his eyes widened in shock. A slender dagger pierced through his neck, its tip gleaming with an eerie cold light. Standing behind him was none other than the elderly woman. The old woman effortlessly lifted the corpse, and after seeing her leaving the room, they continued their discussion. The high priest didn't believe the rat was lying, but he had to investigate personally. If he truly discovered mercenaries and witches, he would bribe that group of thugs, numbering in the thousands. Though they couldn't compare to the judgment army, they were more than capable of overwhelming the unequipped mercenaries. As for the witch, he would leave it to the faceless. Offering the crystal bottle in her hands, the old woman bowed, then suddenly her entire body burst into crackling sounds as if her bones were rubbing against each other. Her figure rapidly grew her white hair turning black in the blink of an eye. The wrinkled and loose skin tightened, regaining its tautness and elasticity. Time seemed to flow backward for her. When she stretched her body again, she transformed into a stunningly beautiful woman. The priest smiled with satisfaction, recalling this was the face of who had been hanged at the city gate. The woman nodded and approached the high priest. Among the four people, he had spent the most time on her. On the third day, outside the eastern gate of the capital, Nightingale silently watched the group of ragged refugees. They had been gathered in waves using Echo's ability to guide the refugees and were slowly moving towards the docks with Brian. Nightingale noticed that Echo seemed sad and asked what was wrong. Echo's expression appeared somewhat sorrowful. She had always thought that she was treated coldly because she was from the Sand Tribe, but these people showed the same lack of mercy towards their own kind. Echo said, I truly hope to see His Highness Roland become the king, to put an end to the conflicts, so that different races, ordinary people, and witches can live freely and peacefully. Nightingale smiled and replied, That day will surely come. Echo chuckled and burst into joyful laughter, instantly lightening the sadness on her face. However, the calm did not last. After finishing lunch, Tassa, who went to the capital to gather information, brought bad news. They had received information that the RAT organization had already mobilized their forces and planned to surround them. Tassa had to stay in the city tonight to oversee the sale of the medicine. He wouldn't be able to bid farewell to Axe tomorrow. Axe patted Tassa's arm and said, We'll see each other when His Highness visits the capital in the future. The Faceless had already quietly crossed the canal long before the sun completely set, sneaking towards the rear of the mercenary camp. As a member of the arbitration court, she had assisted the bishop in dealing with many fallen ones, including witches who defected from the church and religious followers corrupted by the secular world. She was dispatched to the capital to accomplish a crucial mission, to convert a man into the king of Grey Castle. Her true name was Afra. There were still patrols around the camp, and the bonfires burned brightly. Figures moved back and forth, appearing to be well organized and not in chaos. She drew a dagger from her waist and took advantage of a mercenary's diverted gaze. From a blind spot in his vision, 
she swiftly lunged behind him, covering his mouth with one hand and driving the dagger into his neck with the other. In the camp, lightning descended from the sky, signaling that Axe had led the rifle squad to counterattack. Everyone in the camp remained unworried about the rat organization, believing that the soldiers would repel them. The camp's security remained vigilant. Suddenly, a man walked into the clearing, then Afra felt a cold, hard object press against the back of her head. Afra felt a chill run through her entire body. How, was this possible? She swallowed hard and lowered her voice. What kind of joke is this? I am Vort, you know. But instead of a response, a cold smirk echoed behind her. Nightingale, able to see the magical energy within him, knew he was not the real Vort. Afra's heart sank to the depths. This was her last chance. Realizing that her expertise lay in assassination rather than direct combat, she seized the moment. She swiftly turned, elbowing Nightingale's arm and triggering a mechanism hidden in her sleeve. In an instant, a white powder sprayed out, aimed toward the back. Then Afra lunged towards the four witches near the bonfire with a dagger, Wendy Bravely jumped to shield Lily. Nightingale hesitated no longer. She raised her hands, and her shimmering silver weapon burst into flames. Afra was suddenly pushed hard, losing her balance and falling backward onto the ground. After firing her shot, Nightingale remained in place, watching as the man struck in the chest and fell, his body contorting and shrinking until he transformed back into a woman with blue hair. In her final moments, Afra reminisced about the bishop, slowly closing her eyes. Nightingale suppressed the turmoil in her heart, holstered her gun, and ran back to Wendy's side. Wendy was unharmed, with only a small hole in the outer layer of her protective suit, while the soft inner layer remained intact. Lily burst into tears, and Wendy gently stroked her head. Lily sniffled, burying her face in Wendy's chest, emitting a muffled sound. Wendy was also taken aback, having been focused on shielding them and forgetting to use her own abilities. If she had summoned a gust of wind, she wouldn't have been approached. Fortunately, they had protective suits. Before departing, His Highness Roland had given each witch a specially tailored vest, instructing them never to take it off. The vest was lightweight but appeared somewhat bulky. It seemed to be composed of multiple layers, with each layer made of highly flexible fabric adorned with a coating depicting the ability from Soraya. It was difficult to pierce with sharp objects and provided excellent defense against blades and crossbows. Without its protection, Wendy would have had a hard time lasting until they reached Nanawa for treatment. Lightning slowly descended next to the fallen witch, and she couldn't understand why she had attacked them. Weren't they all witches? Nightingale stared at the lifeless woman who had lunged at Wendy without a hint of hesitation, only displaying determination and a sense of inevitability. Nightingale sighed. She wasn't one of us, just a pitiful individual. On the eve of their journey back to the border town, the large-scale night assault that had long been detected ended with one dead and four injured by the First Army. The battle was not uneven, the enemies couldn't even get close to them. Soon, the rat organization scattered, and the four wounded soldiers had their wounds bandaged. With Lily present, there was no risk of infection. As for the soldier killed by the witch, he was properly laid to rest, and the entire group attended his funeral. This was the First Army's first expeditionary operation, not a failure but not an outright success either. With complex emotions, they embarked on their journey back home. On a ship, a tall and rugged-looking man was explaining his knowledge of the sea. Tilly, filled with curiosity, asked many questions of this great explorer. He was Thunder, the first explorer to discover the Shadow Isles. However, since his disappearance in a shipwreck two years ago, many believed he had tragically perished. Little did they expect him to appear on Slumbering Isle, where he made an agreement with Princess Tilly to chart new sea routes, map the seas, and search for more ancient relics, with the assistance of witches sent by Tilly. As for the two missing years, it was a topic they had not mentioned, and Tilly remained silent about it. However, she couldn't help but feel that His Highness knew something, or else they wouldn't have such a strong understanding between them. Thunder looked at Molly, grateful that she had summoned the large creature yesterday, 
which helped the ship to remain in scathe even during the fierce storm. The crew members who had initially been resistant to Molly and the other witches were now in awe and admiration and gained much respect to her. Thunder often pondered that perhaps witches were the most suitable explorers. After all, they had qualities that others didn't possess. Tilly smiled faintly and said, There is already a witch that inherited the title of the most outstanding explorer. Thunder took a deep draw from his pipe, exhaling a long trail of smoke, saying, Let's hope so. Molly followed the sailors and learned how to fish. Suddenly, a dark shadow appeared beneath the emerald waters, and as Molly's familiar pulled on the fishing rod, the resistance grew stronger. It was about to surface. The sailor urged Molly to quickly let go of the fishing rod. Before he could finish his sentence, a strange creature had already leaped out of the water, opening its large mouth and lunging toward Molly. It seemed it was about to devour Molly. However, Ash was faster than the creature. She scooped up the little girl with her left hand and swung her giant sword with her right, smashing it onto the attacker's head. The monster let out a painful shriek as it was sent crashing down from the air, desperately flailing its six legs, attempting to escape back into the water. But Ash did not give it that chance. She set Molly down, gripped her sword with both hands and ruthlessly impaled the creature, pinning it to the deck. According to rumors, these were supposed to be mutated sea spirits, but in reality, they were demonic beasts, the lookout suddenly shouted. Fog is forming. Stay alert, everyone. Thunder commanded loudly. Lower the sails, we are entering the shadowed isle. Ash noticed that the previously clear sky suddenly turned dark, and the emerald green sea transformed into inky green as if a pool of ink was spreading beneath the water's surface. Before long, the ship was enveloped in thick mist, and Ash stood at the stern unable to see the figures at the bow. With the assistance of the witches, they could anticipate danger in advance. Thunder explained that the tides here occur every half month and are extremely fast. Tilly asked why they didn't wait for the seawater to recede completely before proceeding. Thunder explained that they couldn't wait because once the tide receded, they wouldn't be able to see the ghostly Crimson River anymore. Soon, they witnessed several red figures appearing in the dark green waters, they flickered past like phantoms. These were the unique fish of the Shadow Isle. Gradually, the fish multiplied, gathering beneath the ship, making it seem as if the sailing vessel was being carried by the fish. If it weren't for their opposing directions, Ash would have even felt as though the ship was being lifted by the fish. Thunder explained that the main island resembled a triangular tower with a massive hollow passage running through its center. These crimson-scaled fish liked to lay their eggs and reproduce in the cavern. During low tide, the hollow would emerge above the water's surface, and the resident fish would be the first to sense the changing water levels and swarm out. So, as long as they followed the ghostly crimson river, they would reach the main island of the Shadow Isle. They soon arrived at the Shadow Isle. They waited until darkness fell and the seawater receded completely to the bottom of the cave. Seizing the opportunity, Thunder commanded the sailors to anchor the ship and secure it to the copper stakes at the entrance of the cave with sturdy hemp ropes. Pointing towards the ancient ruins above, the upcoming journey could only be described as unimaginable. The witches followed Thunder and his companions, entering through a stone door at the bottom of the colossal abyss. They ascended the winding stone steps, where water trickled and murmured. Despite holding torches, the flickering flames seemed feeble and insignificant compared to the seemingly endless staircase. Progressing through the abyss-like darkness, Tilly tightly clutched Ash's arm, displaying a vulnerability that was absent from her usual confident demeanor as the fifth princess, who faced difficulties with unwavering confidence. Her greatest weakness was fear of the dark. As they reached the deepest part of the cave, they arrived at a massive door, not made out of stone, but towering metal door. Ash, wielding her sword with one hand, took the lead and entered the room. After surveying the surroundings to confirm there was no danger, she allowed Tilly and everyone else to step inside. As torches were hung on the walls, a spacious hall unfolded before them. Despite its size, it appeared empty and bare, with only a few tables and chairs. The scattered magic stones they had been searching for were nowhere to be found. Suddenly, Tilly seemed to notice something. 
Following her gaze, Ash saw Tilly reach out and tear away the green moss, revealing a gem partially embedded in the stone wall. Tilly attempted to pull it out, but the gem didn't budge. While Tilly was deep in thought, she placed her hand on the prism and closed her eyes. Suddenly, a beam of light flashed at the center of the prism. But soon, a rumbling sound reverberated from behind the wall, as if some mechanism had been triggered. Before long, the commotion spread throughout the entire hall. The sailors stood up in panic, and Ashen quickly picked up Tilly and retreated. Suddenly, an iron chain dropped down, followed by the opening of a door. Dozens of small holes appeared on the walls, each containing a stone emitting a pure white glow. Even Thunder was stunned. These stones on the walls looked like the snow crystals produced in the Eternal Winter Kingdom. But twice as bright. A fist-sized piece could be sold for hundreds of gold royals. They soon entered a new room, where wooden tables, chairs, bookshelves, and cabinets remained intact. The surfaces were covered in thick dust, and remnants of cobwebs could still be seen. Tilly picked up a book spread open on the table, gently brushing off the dust, and started flipping through the pages. The writings were in a language she had never seen before. At the other end of the room, they noticed a peculiar-looking object. At first glance, it resembled a thick, sturdy metal tube, somewhat like a telescope used for navigation. Thunder leaned in and looked through the lens for a while, but he couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. Ash noticed a copper plate on the wall, with a small hole beneath it, seemingly intended for inserting a key. Gripping the handle, Ash pulled with all her might, causing the entire copper plate to come loose from the wall. A massive magic stone was wedged in the groove behind the copper plate. Unlike the previous two stones, it appeared much larger in size and had a purplish hue. Tilly decided to activate it with her magic. After a long time, beads of sweat formed on her forehead. Tilly sensed the magic stone continuously absorbing magic, indicating the presence of a complex mechanism behind it. Just as Tilly's magic was nearly depleted, the entire room began to shake. The tremendous amount of dust caused Thunder to cough a few times. He opened his eyes, which had been pressed against the end of the metal tube. Then, he was left speechless, utterly shocked by the sight before him. At the other end emerged a vast expanse of land, with the cliffs that seemed bottomless. In the center of the cliff stood an immensely colossal stone archway. The depths within the archway were profound and dark, resembling a colossal maw ready to devour anyone who dared enter. A few days later, Maisie brought a letter. Roland spread out the paper and handed Maisie a piece of beef jerky. She opened her mouth and swiftly devoured the jerky, then obediently nestled her head into the feathers by the table. The letter began with, Dear Brother, or rather, Prince Roland Wimbledon. I have received your letter, and I wholeheartedly agree with your perspective, it read. Though I am unsure why you have suddenly changed your ways and abandoned your previous frivolous lifestyle to help the witches. But since you have taken this path, the church has become our common enemy. Tilly mentioned in the letter that she had become a witch herself, leading her own team of witches. Roland have gained the approval of Ashes and Maisie. Tilly expressed her interest in the Roland's ability evolution theory and the steam engine. She agreed to the formation of an alliance and agreed to provide auxiliary abilities witches to assist him. She provided Roland a list of some of the witch's abilities, and through Maisie, she informed him that they could set off next month. However, due to safety concerns, the group should not exceed five people at once, and protection should be arranged. Tilly hoped that Roland would treat the witches of Slumbering Isle as fairly as he treated the witches in his own territory. Finally, she expressed her desire to end the church's oppression and build a new order, a kingdom where not only witches but anyone would be free from unjust persecution. Roland set aside the letter, feeling an indescribable sense of joy. He smiled and tucked away the paper, then pulled out another piece of beef jerky and offered it to Maisie. She opened her mouth, snatched the jerky, and swallowed it in a couple of bites before obediently resting her head on the table, burying it in the feathers. He had never expected Tilly to accept his invitation. The surprises brought by her response far exceeded his expectations. 
Her openness and enthusiasm made him feel like he had found an extraordinary ally. With her on his side, he no longer had to fight the church alone. As for the secure transportation route, he had already considered it thoroughly. The more he thought about it, the more excited Roland became. However, his thoughts were interrupted by a sudden explosion from the rear. Startled, he woke up from his daydream. Thinking it might be an enemy attack, he hurriedly opened the window to investigate the direction. It was the chemical laboratory. Roland rushed to the laboratory near the Crimson Water River, but the damage wasn't as severe as he had imagined. When he arrived, he saw Kyle Sichi lying on the ground with traces of blood leading from the accident site to the front door. His face was blurred, a mixture of blood and pus resulting from the corrosive acid that had splashed during the explosion. Several fingers were missing from his hand, and white bones could be seen through the flesh. The apprentices had already administered emergency treatment, indicating that they had encountered similar incidents while in Crimson Water City. They had successfully evacuated the injured, applied tourniquets, and sought help. Roland instructed his guards to secure the entrance and wait for Nanawa's arrival. He then entered the side room with Carter to search for the alchemist's fingers. Even if the young girl managed to heal his injuries, he wouldn't be able to conduct chemical experiments without his fingers. It would be a significant loss for the border town. Upon entering the room, an unpleasant odor filled the air, and Roland recognized it as the smell of nitrogen dioxide. The glass bottles on the lab table were shattered, and acid flowed down the tabletop, gathering into puddles on the floor. Something else caught Roland's attention in the storage cabinet above the lab table. He removed the peculiar-shaped bottle and realized it was a bottle of hard liquor sold in the market. Surprisingly, a considerable portion of the liquor had been consumed, with only a little left in the bottle. One of the guards reported Nanawa's arrival, and Roland left Carter to continue searching for the severed finger among the shards of glass. He returned to the front door of the laboratory. For Nanawa, this level of treatment had become routine. Compared to the girl who used to be scared of blood and would faint at the sight of a horrifying wound, she had grown a lot both in terms of her abilities and courage. Nanawa smiled proudly and said, I can now heal these minor injuries directly. Nanoa placed her hands above the alchemist's chest, closed her eyes, and immediately there was a change in Kyle's injuries. His face healed rapidly, returning to its original state in no time. Surprisingly, even the severed fingers began to grow outward, although at a much slower pace. First, the bones extended, followed by the flesh and finally the nails and skin. It took about 15 minutes for his fingers to fully regenerate. At that moment, the guard reported that only three fingers had been found, and one of the severed fingers may have been completely destroyed in the explosion. When did you learn to do this? Roland asked in astonishment. Nanawa smiled and replied, about a week ago, she had been training with chickens, she found that it didn't require severed limbs to grow back. As long as she infused enough magic power, it could gradually regenerate. Nanawa recalled what Roland said that every part of the human body is composed of cells, so if there is a loss of cells at the severed area, magical power should be able to compensate for it. So she thought, why not try to repair the entire limb? And that's what she attempted, her magical power is still too limited, so if it were a hand or a lower leg, she would be unable to accomplish it. Kyle slowly opened his eyes, as if forgetting what he had just experienced. Suddenly, he jumped up with excitement and exclaimed, I've done it. Mercury fulminate. It turned out that the missing reactant was alcohol. Prior to this, he had tested dozens of different materials without any progress. Frustrated, he went out and bought some liquor. Then it dawned on him that he had learned in basic chemistry that alcohol was an organic solvent and a necessary ingredient for certain reactions. So he distilled and purified the hard liquor, and after six attempts, he finally succeeded. As he filtered out the precipitate in the test tube, there was a sudden explosion. Although Roland was happy, he still wished that Kyle would prioritize his safety. He pointed at Nanawa and said, if it weren't for Nanawa which abilities to heal him, Cammo might have been. Before Roland could finish his sentence, Kyle interjected, good heavens. 
Are you saying this witch can cure injuries caused by alchemy or rather, chemical experiments? Ha ha ha. Your Highness, this is truly marvelous. With her around, I no longer have to worry about danger. I can test everything now. Unexpectedly, Kyle's reaction was quite different from what Roland had anticipated. However, with this new development, the percussion cap for the fixed bullets finally showed promise. Back in his office, Roland immediately began working on the designs for the new machinery. During the days when the First Army and the witches went to the capital, he wasn't idle at all. On the contrary, Roland felt busier than ever before. The border town needed to construct residential buildings and dormitories capable of housing tens of thousands of people within six months. Moreover, there was an outbreak at Changji stronghold, and Petrov earnestly requested Roland's assistance. The newly designed smelting furnace was also successfully built with a sturdy cast iron exterior, clay bricks as the inner layer, and Soroya's earth coating, boasting excellent heat resistance. This furnace could produce around 50 tons of molten steel at a time. Returning to his office, Roland retrieved the parchment paper enclosed with the fifth princess's letters from the drawer and spread it out on the desk. Finally, he had reached the long-awaited moment, the selection of visiting witches. Under normal circumstances, Roland would have been yawning incessantly, but today he was full of enthusiasm and had no trace of drowsiness. He then opened one of the parchment papers and began writing his reply. He apologized for the delayed response and expressed his excitement and satisfaction with Tilly's decision. He acknowledged that his achievements today were made possible with the help of the witches, and he hoped to promote this ideology throughout the entire western region and the entire kingdom. To accomplish this, he must destroy the entire church and rescue the people from ignorance and superstition. It would be a long process, requiring more of Tilly's assistance. As for the details, he wished to discuss them in person with Tilly in the future. Finally, he wrote down the names of the five selected witches. The terrain shaper, Lien, state preserver, Candle, the brewmaster, Evelyn, the beast tamer, Honey, and the true sightseer, Sylvie. The first army expeditionary force and the witches had finally returned back to the border town. Nightingale had also returned. Roland wanted her to rest and recover properly since she had been exhausted for the past month. After a moment of silence, Roland thought that Nightingale couldn't let go of her feelings towards the witch who had opposed them. Nightingale said that she didn't want to kill her, but when she saw her aiming for Wendy, she understood that nothing could stop her except death. Roland paused for a moment and said, Do you remember what you said to me when we returned from defeating Timothy's militia? Nightingale thought for a moment and replied, It's not your fault, right? Roland reassured her that which was raised by the church since childhood, and they were different. You saved Wendy and the others, he added. Nightingale smiled, knowing that Roland was comforting her. She didn't feel grief for the enemy. She had come to terms with it during their time on the ship. Roland was relieved that Nightingale didn't feel lost or confused. Suddenly, Nightingale turned around and asked Roland a question that made his face turn red. What have you been doing with Anna these days? Nightingale's voice grew softer, but her eyes remained fixed on the prince. You know what I mean. Roland coughed a couple of times, feeling embarrassed. He had been busy every day with resettling the refugees, leaving little opportunity for private moments with Anna. Nightingale's eyes instantly brightened, knowing that Roland wasn't lying. Before Roland could finish his sentence, Nightingale disappeared abruptly. Then he felt a soft pair of lips on his own, a fleeting touch that lasted only a moment. Oh my God! After a good while, he realized what had just happened. Nightingale had suddenly vanished, and he heard her whisper in his ear, I don't want to change anything and I don't intend to come between you and Anna. I just want to stay by your side, that's all. Please forgive me for not showing myself, because I don't know how to face you. Your Highness, you don't dislike me, do you? Roland knew it was impossible for him to dislike Nightingale. The obstacles in his heart came from over 20 years of ingrained beliefs. His feelings for Nightingale went beyond mere fondness, and he couldn't deceive himself about that. 
In that case, she whispered softly, let's not say anything. It's not your fault, and I just did what I wanted to do. After dinner, Anna walked into the kitchen carrying a big bag of bird's kiss mushrooms. Just then, Nightingale suddenly darted out from the wall. Hey, what are you up to, she asked. Anna explained that she wanted to use the mushrooms to make a late-night snack for His Highness. Roland had been working late into the night these days and would often get hungry. Nightingale looked at Anna and asked if she could teach her how to make it. Sure, Anna smiled and began explaining the differences between bird's kiss mushrooms and ordinary mushrooms. She shared that her mother would always gather some for her birthday and cook a dish with them. Anna prepared the sauce and carefully roasted the mushrooms over the fire. Nightingale asked if Roland had been working late recently. Anna explained that he had been working on resettling refugees and drawing blueprints for new machinery, often not sleeping until past midnight. You've missed His Highness a lot, haven't you? Anna asked. Nightingale's hand trembled slightly, causing a mushroom to fall into the butter. Um, well, I guess so, she stuttered. Not just you, but Lightning, Lily, Echo, and Wendy also miss His Highness. They say there's not even a place to take a bath there, and they've been wanting to come back for a while, Anna suddenly noticed a strange expression on Nightingale's face. What's wrong, she asked. Nightingale scratched her head and admitted that she did miss him quite a bit. While chatting, Nightingale accidentally burnt a mushroom, and they made a few more attempts. After a while, Anna suggested they should go together and bring the dishes to Roland. However, Nightingale insisted that Anna should go alone and bring the mushroom to Roland. Anna arrived at Roland's office and told Roland that Nightingale said, she don't know what expression to have when she see Roland now. Anna initially thought that Nightingale felt embarrassed to face Roland because she had eaten some while cooking. But then she realized that she had also eaten some herself. Roland smiled, looked at the mushroom skewers, picked one up, and reminisced about the evening. He took a bite and his clothes exploded, transforming him into a character from the food war, Shokujuki no Soma. The taste started with the sweetness of honey, followed by the juicy essence of the mushrooms, reminding him of MSG. He took another skewer, but this one seemed a bit too salty. Looking at the plate of mushrooms, Roland feels the mushroom looked clumsy yet adorable. In his past life as a mechanical dog, he was focused on studying and learning, rarely interacting with the any female. Even after graduating and finding a job at a design institute, the situation didn't change much, and he didn't understand how to respond to their affections. Roland lets out a soft sigh. There is still a long way to go before completely overthrowing the church, and he can take his time to consider what to do next. For now, he decides to concentrate on completing the tasks at hand. The next morning, when Roland stepped onto the wooden platform set up in the square, the surroundings were already crowded with people. The border town has undergone a tremendous transformation from its previous desolate and impoverished appearance. The sparse old houses in the town have all been demolished and replaced by construction sites and uniform brick buildings. Standing on the wooden platform, Roland's voice was amplified by echo, making it clear to everyone. He began his speech. In the past six months, we have overcome the demonic beasts, defeated the duke, and transformed the town. Many people have contributed a lot to this transformation, including a few outstanding individuals who were once ordinary people, just like all of you. Roland looked around and continued loudly, but now, they will receive generous rewards. These include a metal handcrafted by me, 100 gold dragons, and 5 acres of land. This ceremony will be held once a year, regardless of birth or wealth. As long as you achieve outstanding merits, you will receive this highest honor. As Roland's words fell, the crowd erupted with tremendous fever, shouting, Long live His Highness! After the crowd quieted down, the heroes began to step onto the wooden platform. The first person to approach the stage was Axe, who was previously just an ordinary hunter. Throughout the wars that have erupted in the border town, he always charged at the front line. Axe appeared excited yet nervous. Roland personally placed the medal on him, and Axe's voice trembled slightly as he tried to restrain his emotions. 
The second person was Kyle Sichi, an alchemist from the alchemy workshop in the central part of the kingdom. Kyle made significant contributions to the development and improvement of weapons. Roland also said that the laboratory is currently recruiting apprentice alchemists. Those who pass the selection will receive generous rewards and have the opportunity to become masters like Kyle. Kyle himself appeared impatient, and he took the medal with an irritated tone, saying, Is this why you called me here? What a waste of time. I'd rather conduct a few more experiments. Roland patted his shoulder and said, Once the laboratory expands twice its size, I plan to write intermediate chemistry and entrust it to you for teaching. Kyle's attitude instantly changed, and he kept bowing in gratitude. Next, before Roland could even introduce her, the square erupted with thunderous cheers. Miss Nanoa. Miss Nanoa is here. Miss Nanoa, thank you for curing my husband, someone exclaimed, addressing her as the angel. Miss Nanoa, she's looking at me. No, she's looking at me. In the midst of the celebration, two individuals in the crowd playfully argued about catching Nanoa's attention. Nanoa couldn't help but cover her mouth, her eyes becoming moist. Roland believed that other witches present shared the same feelings as her, they had finally shed the oppressive label of evil imposed upon them by the church and could now walk under the sun as ordinary people. Roland smiled and gently patted her head, saying, no need to be afraid, just respond to everyone's enthusiasm. Remember, you are now a representative of the witch union. She sniffed and wiped away the tears that were about to fall, bowing gracefully and saying, thank you, everyone. The ceremony lasted until noon, and Roland, who played the roles of presenter, commentator, and host, was exhausted by the end. Fortunately, the ceremony concluded successfully with the tolling of the noon bell and the sound of cannon salutes. Sweating profusely, Roland returned to the castle and as he reached the third floor, he saw Anna standing by the office door with a smile on her face. She blinked her beautiful azure eyes and led Roland into a room. Roland pushed open the door in a daze and stood frozen in place. In front of him stood twelve witches, arranged neatly in two rows. At the forefront were Scroll and Wendy. Upon seeing the prince, everyone lifted the corners of their dresses, bent their knees, and bowed in reverence. Thank you, Prince Roland, they all said in unison. Nice.